Hi again, this is Vio. Let's explore a few straightforward tips to improve your American English pronunciation. One notable tip involves a common habit found among Americans, which is substituting an for end. Pay attention to how phrases like my friends and I often become my friends and I in casual conversation. This pattern, where and is shortened to an, is prevalent in many expressions. Such as you and I becoming you and I this tendency to abbreviate and to n is widespread, highlighting the importance of recognizing these subtle differences in everyday speech. Another observation I've made, particularly from watching a lot of YouTube content, everyday speech. The way certain Another observation I've made, words. particularly from this watching a lot of YouTube content, everyday speech. The way Another observation, words. observation I've made, words. particularly example, from watching a lot of YouTube content, everyday speech. Another observation I've made, particularly from watching a lot of YouTube content, everyday speech. Off camera, but rather a strategic choice for clarity in his videos. This method of stressing significant words is not exclusive to YouTube. It can be applied in various contexts to enhance communication and comprehension. Let's jump right in with some simple tips to improve your American English pronunciation. Here's a cool trick many Americans use. They shorten the end sound at the end of words. For instance, in casual conversation, my friends and I often becomes my friends and me. This pattern, where and becomes n, is common in lots of phrases. You and I can turn into you and me too. Recognizing these subtle changes in everyday speech is key. Another thing I've noticed, especially watching YouTube, is how creators play up certain words. This technique really helps understanding, especially complex topics. Take Graham Stephan, a personal finance YouTuber, in his videos. He has a unique way of stressing important phrases. For example, in a video about seven daily habits that changed my life, listen to how he emphasizes key words. This makes the content clearer. This deliberate emphasis isn't necessarily how he speaks in real life, but it's a smart choice for clarity in his videos. Stressing important words isn't just a YouTube thing either. It reflects the way Americans commonly speak in everyday situations, enhancing the clarity and impact of their words. Examples like I'm going to buy milk or oh my god, I love that painting illustrate this point. Paying attention to this can provide valuable insights into effective communication, particularly in making complex information more understandable. My third favorite tip involves the strategic use of interjections, which not only make conversations sound more authentically American, but also offer a brief moment to gather your thoughts before continuing. For instance, the interjection wow can significantly enhance the expressiveness of a statement, as in wow, that's amazing, moving on. A common practice among Americans that you've likely noticed is the abbreviation of phrases like going to and wanted to gonna and wanna. This linguistic shortcut is something my American friends have passed on to me, and it's a staple in everyday American speech. For example, the formal I'm going to go to the store to pick up some groceries often becomes I'm gonna go grab some groceries. Similarly, do you want to go to dinner? Is frequently shortened to wanna go to dinner? This casual form of speech is prevalent across various contexts from making plans to expressing desires, like wanna go shopping or I wanna go to New York for spring break. However, it's important to maintain the correct grammatical form in more formal contexts. This mirrors how Americans naturally speak in everyday situations, making their words clearer and more impactful. Think about how we say things like, I'm gonna buy milk, or, oh my gosh, I love that painting. These examples show how emphasizing words can make your point clearer. Paying attention to this can be a real asset for effective communication, especially when it comes to explaining complex things in a way people understand. My third favorite tip is about using interjections strategically. 
These little words not only make your English sound more American, but they also give you a quick moment to collect your thoughts before you keep talking. For example, saying wow, that's amazing, adds a lot more expression than just saying that's amazing. Another thing you've probably noticed is how Americans shorten phrases. We turn things like going to and want to into gonna and wanna. This is a super common shortcut in everyday American speech. For instance, the formal way to say I'm going to the store to pick up groceries might become I'm gonna grab some groceries in casual conversation. Similarly, do you want to go to dinner? Often gets shortened to wanna go to dinner. This casual way of speaking is used in all kinds of situations, from making plans wanna go shopping, to expressing desires I wanna go to New York for spring break. Just remember, in more formal settings, it's important to use proper grammar. Of course, it's important to use wants to instead of the super casual wanna in formal situations. Contexts from making plans to expressing desires, like wanna go shopping. Or I want to go to New York for spring break. However, it's important to maintain the correct grammatical form in more formal contexts. This mirrors how Americans naturally speak in everyday situations, making their words clearer and more impactful. Think about how we say things like "I'm gonna buy milk" or "Oh my gosh, I love that painting." These examples show how emphasizing words can make your point clearer. Paying attention to this can be a real asset for effective communication, especially when it comes to explaining complex things in a way people understand. My third favorite tip is about using interjections strategically. These little words not only make your English sound more American, but they also give you a quick moment to collect your thoughts before you keep talking. For example, saying "Wow, that's amazing" adds a lot more expression than just saying "That's amazing." Another thing you've probably noticed is how Americans shorten phrases. We turn things like "going to" and "want to" into "gonna" and "wanna." This is a super common shortcut in everyday American speech. For instance, the formal way to say "I'm going to the store to pick up groceries" might become "I'm going to grab some groceries" in casual conversation. Similarly, "Do you want to go to dinner?" often gets shortened to "want to go to dinner." This casual way of speaking is used in all kinds of situations, from making plans want to go shopping, to expressing desires I want to go to New York for spring break. Just remember, in more formal settings, it's important to use proper grammar. Of course, it's important to use wants to instead of the super casual wanna in formal situations. Hi again, this is Vio. Let's explore a few straightforward tips to improve your American English pronunciation. One notable tip involves a common habit found among Americans, which is substituting "an" for "and." Pay attention to how phrases like "my friends and I" often become "my friends and I" in casual conversation. This pattern, where "and" is shortened to "an," is prevalent in many expressions. Such as you and I becoming you and I, this tendency to abbreviate and to n is widespread, highlighting the importance of recognizing these subtle differences in everyday speech. Another observation I've made, particularly from watching a lot of YouTube content, involves the way certain creators emphasize specific words. This technique greatly aids understanding, especially in complex subjects. Take, for example. Graham Stephan, a personal finance blogger, in his videos, he has a unique way of highlighting key phrases, as seen in a video where he discusses seven daily habits that changed my life. Notice the emphasis placed on critical words, making the content more accessible. It's important to note that this deliberate emphasis isn't necessarily how he speaks off camera, but rather a strategic choice for clarity in his videos. This method of stressing significant words is not exclusive to YouTube. It can be applied in various contexts to enhance communication and comprehension. Let's jump right in with some simple tips to improve your American English pronunciation. Here's a cool trick many Americans use: they shorten the n sound at the end of words. For instance, in casual conversation, "My friends and I" often becomes "My friends and me." This pattern. Where and becomes n is common in lots of phrases. You and I can turn into you and me too. 
Recognizing these subtle changes in everyday speech is key. Hex serves as the milder counterpart to hell, often used to maintain politeness or when a less harsh term is preferred. It is common among both children and adults seeking a gentler alternative. On the other hand, hell might appear in more adult dialogues, reflecting stronger emotions or emphasis. Expressions like what the heck are you doing or why the hell did you do that are not just queries but convey a range of feelings including annoyance or astonishment. These phrases can intensify a statement's emotional weight, whether expressing frustration like why the heck did we buy this house or confusion like where in the heck did I put my keys. While these words can inject humor or emphasis into conversations, it's wise to use them judiciously, especially in formal contexts or with certain audiences to avoid potential offense. They are best reserved for informal settings among friends or colleagues. Imagine you're at a football game with your American buddies. If something crazy happens and you can't believe it, you might yell out what the heck just happened or what the hell are they doing? These are perfect expressions to show how surprised or frustrated you are by the game. Phrases like who the heck is that guy can also come in handy during these heated discussions. See how versatile hack and hell can be. They're not just for everyday conversations. They're all over pop culture too. For example, Taylor Swift uses hell for emphasis in her song Wildest Dreams when she sings about someone being handsome as hell, meaning incredibly attractive. This shows how these terms can be used in many ways and add a lot of expression to your American English. Finally, I want to talk about a challenge that's probably close to both our hearts, using articles A and the. Coming from a Russian background where articles aren't used, I found this especially tricky. I remember winning an English competition in Russia when I was 16 and then visiting friends in the UK. I asked them to check out my English, and while they said I spoke fluently, they noticed I wasn't always using articles correctly. This was a common mistake in my speaking, and their feedback was a real wake-up call. Now, let's imagine yourself enjoying a football match with your American pals. In moments of disbelief or frustration, you might exclaim, What the hell are they doing? Or what the heck just happened? These expressions are perfect for conveying your astonishment or irritation with the game's events. Phrases like who the hell are you also find their place in such lively discussions. The versatility of hack and hell extends beyond everyday conversations. They are also prevalent in popular culture. For instance, Taylor Swift uses hell for emphasis in her song Wildest Dreams, describing someone as handsome as hell to mean exceptionally attractive. This example illustrates the broad applicability and expressive power of these terms in American English. Finally, I want to touch on a challenge that's particularly close to my heart, and perhaps yours as well. It is the use of articles, a concept starting with the letter A, coming from a Russian background where articles are non-existent. I found this aspect of English particularly tricky. I recall winning an English competition in Russia at 16 and visiting friends in the UK, asking them to evaluate my English. They complimented my fluency but pointed out my inconsistent use of articles. A common oversight in my speech, this feedback was eye-opening. Articles A and the are a big part of American English, and if you leave them out, people will definitely notice. To sound more like a native speaker, you really need to use A and and the correctly in your sentences. For instance, saying when we were in Hawaii, we visited the Big Island or can you pick up a dozen eggs when you go to the store? Shows how articles help us give specific details. Another example is the term an all-nighter, which means staying up all night to work or study. This shows how articles can make your meaning clearer. American English also has a way of blending words together sometimes. For instance, we might say have to instead of half past to. This can be a little tricky for learners because it makes the language flow more smoothly, but it can also be confusing at first. 
Learning how to use articles correctly and understanding when words might be blended together can really improve your American English and make you sound more natural and understandable to native speakers. These are just a few simple tips to help you improve your American English accent. I'll be sharing more advice in future videos, so stay tuned. I'm interested to hear which tip you're going to try first to make your English sound more American. As articles are a staple in American English and their absence is noticeable, it's crucial to incorporate AM appropriately in your sentences to sound more native. For instance, saying when we were in Hawaii, we visited the Big Island or can you pick up a dozen eggs when you go to the store highlights the importance of articles in conveying specific details. Another example is the term an all-nighter, referring to staying up all night to complete work or prepare for a test, showcasing how articles can add clarity to your statements. Moreover, blending words like half and to into half to is a quintessential American English trait, showcasing the language's fluidity and sometimes posing comprehension challenges for learners. Mastering the use of articles and understanding the nuances of word blending can significantly enhance your American English proficiency, making your speech more natural and understandable to native speakers. To wrap up, these straightforward strategies are designed to enhance your American English accent, and I'm eager to share even more insights in upcoming videos. I'm curious to hear which tip you're planning to apply to make your English sound more American. A huge thank you to everyone who watched this video through to the end. I trust you found the information valuable and that you'll begin integrating these suggestions into your daily speech right away. Take care, and I look forward to connecting with you in future videos. Goodbye. Hello everyone, this is Vaya. Today we will learn English with Albert Einstein Wuo. Chapter 1 Young Albert, Albert Einstein was born in a small German town called Alm on March 14, 1879. His mother Pauline was a killing woman who loved music. His father Hermann was a merchant who sold feathers. Albert had a younger sister named Maria, who was his only sibling. Albert's parents noticed that he was different. For other children, as a baby he was quiet and seemed to think a lot. He started talking later than most children. His parents were worried about this, but as Albert grew older, they saw that he was just deep in thought. He liked to figure things out by himself. Their home in Alm was comfortable, but it was not a rich home. They did not have many things, but they had enough. Albert's mother played the piano, and the sound of music often filled their home. This sparked Albert's love for music, a love he kept all his life. When Albert was five years old, his father showed him a compass. A compass is a small tool that points north because of the Earth's magnetic field. This compass made a big impact on Albert. He could not understand how it worked. How could something invisible make the needle move? He thought about this a lot. This was the start of Albert's interest in science. Albert went to a Catholic school in Munich because his parents thought it was the best school in the city. But he did not like the way they taught things there. They wanted students to learn by memorizing, but Albert preferred to learn by understanding. Albert's family was Jewish, but they were not fairly religious. They did not go to the synagogue often, and they did not follow many Jewish traditions. But they were proud of their Jewish heritage. Later in life, Albert would stand up for Jewish people and other groups were treated unfairly. In these early years, Albert learned many important things. He learned about love from his family, about music from his mother, about business from his father, and about fairness from his own heart. But most importantly, he learned about the joy of understanding the world. This joy would guide his life and lead him to make great discoveries in science. In the next part, we will learn about an event that happened. When Albert was a young boy, this event changed his life and started his journey to becoming one of the most famous scientists in the world when Albert was five years old. 
His father, Herman, gave him a small gift. It was not a toy or a book. It was a compass. A compass is a simple tool that shows which way is north. But to young Albert, it was much more than that. It was a mystery, a puzzle that he could not solve. Albert looked at the compass and saw the small needle inside. The needle was not touching anything. There was no string pulling it, no hand pushing it, but still it moved. It always pointed in the same direction towards the north. Albert was amazed. He could not understand how it worked. How could something invisible make the needle move? He asked his father and his teachers, but their answers did not satisfy him. They told him that the compass worked because of something called magnetism, but they could not explain what magnetism was or how it worked. This made Albert even more curious. He wanted to find out the answer by himself. Albert began to think about the compass all the time. He thought about it at school, at home, even in his dreams. He read books about magnetism and electricity. He did experiments with magnets. He tried to imagine what it would be like if he could see the invisible forces that made the compass needle move. This was the beginning of Albert's love for physics. Physics is the science that explains how the world works. It tells us why the sky is blue. Why the Earth goes around the Sun, and why a compass points north. Albert wanted to understand all these things. He wanted to solve the mysteries of the universe. The compass mystery taught Albert an important lesson. It showed him that the world it is full of wonders, and that science can help us understand these wonders. It also showed him that it is okay to ask questions and to be curious. This is how we learn and grow. Albert Einstein was a very curious child. He liked to ask questions and to explore the world around him. He wanted to understand everything. But when he went to school, he faced some challenges. In those days, schools were very different from today. Teachers did not encourage students to ask questions or to think creatively. They wanted students to learn by memorizing facts and rules. They believed that this was the best way to learn, but Albert did not agree. Albert did not like memorizing things. He thought it was boring and useless. He wanted to understand things, not just remember them. He wanted to know why things happened, not just what happened. He believed that learning should be a journey of discovery, not a task of memorization. Albert's teachers did not understand him. They thought he was lazy and disrespectful. They did not like his questions and his arguments. They thought he was a troublemaker. But Albert was not trying to cause trouble. He was just trying to learn in his own way. Albert's parents were worried about him. They wanted him to do well in school and to have a good future. They tried to help him, but they did not know how. They did not understand why. Albert was so different from other children. Despite these challenges, Albert did not give up. He kept asking questions and seeking answers. He kept reading books and doing experiments. He kept dreaming about the mysteries of the universe. The school challenges made Albert stronger. They taught him to be independent and to trust his own mind. They showed him that it is okay to be different and that. It is important to stand up for what you believe in. These lessons helped Albert to become the great scientist that he was. In the end, Albert Einstein did not fit into the traditional education system, but that did not stop him from learning and growing. He found his own path—a path that led him to make some of the most important discoveries in the history of science. In the next chapter. We will follow Albert as he continues his journey. We will see how he went from being a rebellious student to becoming one of the most famous scientists in the world. Chapter two: The path to physics. After finishing school, Albert Einstein decided to continue his education. He wanted to learn more about the world and the way it works. He chose to study physics and mathematics. Because these subjects fascinated him the most. For this, 
He moved to a city in Switzerland called Zurich. There he attended a school known as the Polytechnic Institute. The Polytechnic Institute was a very good school for science and technology. The teachers there were experts in their fields, and the students were some of the brightest young minds in Europe. Albert was excited to be there. He was looking forward to learning new things and meeting new people. Life in Zurich was very different from life in Germany. The city was bigger and busier. The people spoke a different language called Swiss German. At first, Albert had trouble understanding this language, but he studied hard and soon got used to it. He also made friends who helped him adjust to his new life. Studying at the Polytechnic Institute was not easy. The classes were hard and the exams were tough. Albert had to work hard to keep up, but he enjoyed the challenge. He loved learning about physics and mathematics. He loved solving problems and discovering new things. He spent many hours in the library reading books and taking notes. One of his favorite subjects was theoretical physics. This is the part of physics that deals with ideas and theories rather than experiments. It involves a lot of thinking and imagining. Albert was good at this. He had a strong imagination and a sharp mind. He could think about difficult ideas and understand complex theories during his university years. Albert grew a lot as a person and as a student. He learned to live on his own and to take care of himself. He learned to study hard and to work independently. He also learned to think deeply and to question everything. These skills would serve in well in the future, despite the challenges. Albert enjoyed his time at the Polytechnic Institute. He learned a lot and made many friends. He graduated with a degree in physics in 19, ready to start his career as a scientist. In the next part, we will learn about Albert's first job. It was not a job in a university or a research lab, but in a place you might not expect. This job played an important role in Albert's life and career. It helped him develop his ideas and make his first big discoveries. After graduating from the Polytechnic Institute, Albert Einstein faced a problem. He wanted to become a teacher or a researcher, but he could not find a job. This was a difficult time for him. He needed money to live, but he also wanted to continue his studies in physics. Then he found a solution. In 1902, Albert got a job at the Swiss Patent Office in Bern. A patent office is a place where people apply to protect their inventions. They want to make sure that no one else can copy their ideas. The job of the patent office is to check these applications and decide if they are new and useful. Albert's job was to review applications. Related to physics and engineering, he had to read the descriptions, look at the drawings, and understand how the inventions worked. He had to check if they were really new, and if they could be useful. This was a big responsibility, but Albert was up to the task. At first, Albert was not very happy with this job. It was not what he had dreamed of. He wanted to be a scientist, not a patent examiner. But soon he started to see the positive side. Working at the patent office gave Albert a lot of practice in thinking and understanding. He had to analyze complex ideas and solve tricky problems. He had to be careful and precise, but also creative and imaginative. These skills were very useful for his work in physics. The patent office also gave Albert a unique perspective on science. And technology. He saw many new inventions and ideas. He saw how science could be used to create useful things. This inspired him and gave him new ideas for his own research. Despite the long hours at the office, Albert found time to continue his studies in physics. In the evenings and on weekends, he read books, wrote papers, and discussed ideas with his friends. This was his real passion. His real work during his time at the patent office, Albert made some of his most important discoveries.
He developed the theory of relativity and explained the photoelectric effect. These ideas changed the world of physics and made Albert famous. While Albert Einstein was working at the patent office, he was also doing his own research in physics. He was thinking about big questions and trying to find new answers. He was developing his own theories and ideas. He wanted to share these ideas with the world, so he started writing scientific papers. In 1905, Albert wrote four important papers. These papers were about different topics, but they all showed his unique way of thinking. They were all based on careful reasoning and bold imagination. They were all groundbreaking, meaning they brought new ideas to the field of physics. One of these papers was about the photoelectric effect. This is a phenomenon where light can make electrons move. Albert explained this effect using a new idea. He suggested that light is made of small packets of energy, which he called quanta. This idea was very new and very strange, but it explained the photoelectric effect perfectly. For this work, Albert later received a Nobel Prize in physics. Another paper was about the special theory of relativity. This theory changed the way we understand space and time. It said that space and time are connected and that they can change depending on how you move. This idea was very difficult to understand, but it explained many things that other theories could not. When Albert's papers were published, they attracted a lot of attention. Some scientists were excited by his ideas. They saw that Albert was a genius, a new star in the world of physics. They wanted to learn more from him and to work with him. Other scientists were skeptical. They thought Albert's ideas were too strange, too radical. They did not believe his theories and did not want to accept them. They challenged Albert and asked him to prove his ideas. Albert was not afraid of these challenges. He knew that his ideas were new and different. He knew that not everyone would accept them immediately. But he also knew that his ideas were based on solid reasoning and strong evidence. He was confident that they would stand the test of time. In the next chapter, we will learn about Albert's life. After the patent office, we will see how he became a professor and a respected scientist. We'll also see how he used his fame and influence to stand up for peace and justice. Chapter 3 The Breakthrough Year The year 1905 was a turning point in Albert Einstein's life. It was the year when he published for scientific papers. That would change the world of physics forever. This year is often called Albert's Anos Mirabilis, or Miracle Year because of these papers. The first paper was about the size of molecules. And how they move this is a topic in a field of physics. Called statistical mechanics, Albert used a simple but powerful idea to calculate the size of molecules. He also explained a phenomenon called Brayton motion, which is the random movement of tiny particles. In a fluid, this paper was important because it provided strong evidence for the existence of molecules something that was not fully accepted at that time. The second paper was about the photoelectric effect. Albert proposed that light is made of small packets of energy called quanta or photons. He showed that this idea could explain the photoelectric effect perfectly. This paper was revolutionary because it suggested a new way of thinking about light. It was a major contribution to the development of quantum mechanics. A new field of physics, the third paper, was about the special theory of relativity. This theory changed the way we understand space and time. It said that space and time are not separate, but connected into a space-time. It also said that the laws of physics are the same for everyone no matter how they move. This theory was groundbreaking because... It challenged the traditional views of space and time. The fourth paper was an extension of the special theory of relativity. It introduced a famous equation E equals Macarat 2, which says that energy E can be converted into mass AM. 
and vice versa this equation revealed a deep connection between energy and mass, and it has important implications. For many areas of physics, these papers made Albert famous. They show that he was not just a patent examiner, but a brilliant physicist. They open new doors for him, allowing him to leave the patent office and become a professor. They also sparked a lot of debate and discussion, changing the direction of physics for years to come. In the next part, we will learn about Albert's life. After the Anis Mirabilis, we will see how he dealt with his new fame and how he continued to make important contributions to physics. One of the most significant papers Albert Einstein published in his Miracle Year of 1905 was on the special theory of relativity. This theory was a revolutionary, no way of understanding the basic principles of physics before Albert's theory. Scientists thought that time and space were fixed and absolute. This means that they believed time passed at the same rate for everyone, and that space was the same everywhere. But Albert thought differently in his special theory of relativity. Albert proposed that space and time are not absolute, but relative. This means that they can change depending on how you move. If you move very fast, close to the speed of light. Time can slow down for you, and space can become shorter. This idea was very strange, but it made sense mathematically. Another important part of the special theory of relativity is the idea that the speed of light is always the same, no matter how fast you are moving. Light will always travel at the same speed. This was a radical idea, but it explained many experiments and observations. The special theory of relativity was a big shock for the scientific community. It challenged the traditional views of physics. It was difficult to understand and even more difficult to accept. But it was also fascinating and inspiring. It opened up a whole new world of possibilities. The impact of the special theory of relativity was huge. It changed the way scientists think about space and time. It led to many new discoveries and technologies. It also raised many new questions, some of which are still being studied today. One of the most famous results of the special theory of relativity is the equation E equals Mach carry two. This equation says that energy it can be converted into mass m and vice versa. It reveals a deep connection between energy and mass. Two concepts that were thought to be completely separate. This equation has many important implications, from nuclear power to black holes. Another remarkable paper that Albert Einstein wrote in his Miracle Year of 1905 was about the photoelectric effect. This effect is a phenomenon where light can make electrons move. It happens when light shines on a metal surface, causing the metal to emit electrons for many years. A thought experiment is a way of testing an idea in your mind. Without doing a real experiment in a laboratory, Albert used thought experiments a lot in his work. He would imagine different situations and try to predict what would happen based on his theories. He would question assumptions, challenge ideas, and look at things from new perspectives. This was a key part of his creative process. One of the most famous thought experiments is the folding elevator experiment. Which played a crucial role in developing the general theory of relativity. Albert imagined the person inside an elevator, which is falling freely in a gravitational field. According to the principles of physics, the person would not feel their own weight. They would feel as if they were floating in space. Without gravity, this led Albert to a radical conclusion: gravity is not a force. But a curvature of space-time caused by mass and energy. This idea became the foundation of the general theory of relativity. This theory is an extension of the special theory of relativity, which Albert had developed earlier. The special theory deals with situations 
Where there is no gravity, the general theory includes gravity, making it applicable to a wider range of situations. The general theory of relativity was a major achievement in physics. It provided a new understanding of gravity, which is one of the fundamental forces of nature. It predicted many strange and fascinating phenomena, such as black holes and gravitational waves. It also expanded our understanding of the universe, leading to the idea of the Big Bang. Albert's thought experiments were not just mental games; they were a serious method of scientific investigation. They allowed him to explore new ideas, test hypotheses, and make predictions. They show the power of human imagination and creativity in the quest for knowledge and understanding. In the next part, we will learn more about the general theory of relativity and its impact on science and society. We will see how Albert's ideas were tested and confirmed, and how they continue to inspire scientists and thinkers around the world. One of the most exciting moments in Albert Einstein's career came in 1919 when his general theory of relativity was put to a real-world test. This test was based on one of Albert's predictions about how light behaves in a gravitational field. According to the general theory of relativity, gravity is not a force but a curvature of space-time caused by mass and energy. This means that when light passes near a massive object, it should follow a curved path, not a straight line. This effect is known as gravitational lensing. Albert predicted that we could observe this effect during a solar eclipse when the moon covers the sun. The stars near the sun become visible. Their light passes close to the sun on its way to Earth. If Albert's theory was correct, the light should be bent by the sun's gravity, causing the stars to appear slightly out of position. In 1919, a British astronomer named Arthur Eddington organized an expedition to observe a solar eclipse. And test Albert's prediction. Eddington traveled to the island of Princip, off the west coast of Africa, where the eclipse would be visible. He took photographs of the stars near the sun during the eclipse and compared their positions with their normal positions. When Eddington analyzed the photographs, he found that the stars were indeed out of position, just as Albert had predicted. The deviation was small but clear. This was a dramatic confirmation of the general theory of relativity. It was a triumph for Albert and a turning point in the history of physics. News of Eddington's observations spread around the world, making Albert an international celebrity. Newspapers hailed him as a genius and a newton. People were fascinated by his theory, even though it was difficult to understand. They were captivated by the idea that a simple equation E equals Macart two could explain the workings of the universe. In the next part, we will learn about Albert's life. After this momentous event, we will see how he handled his new fame and how he continued to contribute to science and society. We've also learned about his personal life, his beliefs, and his values. The general theory of relativity was one of Albert. Einstein's most significant contributions to science. It revolutionized our understanding of the universe and has had a profound impact on many areas of physics and astronomy. Before the general theory of relativity, scientists use Newton's laws of motion and gravity to describe the universe. These laws are very accurate for many situations, but they do not work well for objects that are very massive. Or very fast, the general theory of relativity provides a more complete and accurate description of the universe, especially for these extreme situations. One of the most important results of the general theory of relativity is the concept of black holes. A black hole is a region of space-time where gravity is so strong that nothing can escape, not even light. Black holes were first predicted. By the general theory of relativity, and they have been observed by astronomers many times. 
Since then, they are one of the most mysterious and fascinating phenomena in the universe. Another important result of the general theory of relativity is the concept of gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are ripples in space-time caused by the acceleration of massive objects. They were first detected in 2015, 100 years after Albert predicted them. This discovery was a major achievement in physics, and it opened a new way of observing the universe. The general theory of relativity also changed our understanding of the universe. As a whole, it led to the idea of the Big Bang, which says that the universe began as a hot, dense state about 13.8 billion years ago. This idea has been confirmed by many observations and is now the standard model of cosmology. In addition to these scientific impacts, the general theory of relativity has had a cultural impact. It has changed the way we think about space and time, matter and energy reality and perception. It has inspired artists, writers, philosophers and many others. It has become a symbol of human curiosity and creativity. A testament to our ability to uncover the secrets of the universe. In the next chapter, we will learn about Albert's life after the confirmation of the general theory of relativity. We will see how he dealt with his fame, how he pursued a scientific work, and how he became a voice for peace and human rights. Chapter 5 Einstein's Later Years in the 1930s, the world changed dramatically, and so did Albert Einstein's life. The rise of the Nazi party in Germany brought with it a wave of anti-Semitism, making life dangerous for Jewish people like Albert. He decided to leave Germany for good. Albert was invited to join the newly formed Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, United States. This was a unique institution designed to provide a peaceful environment for scholars to pursue their research without the pressures of teaching or administrative duties. For Albert, it was a perfect place to continue his work. In 1933, Albert and his wife Elsa moved to Princeton. They bought a house at 112 Mercer Street, which became their home for the rest of their lives. Albert quickly settled into his new life. He enjoyed the quiet small town atmosphere of Princeton. He liked to take long walks, play the violin and sail on a nearby lake. He also enjoyed the company of other scholars. At the Institute, at the Institute, Albert worked on many scientific projects. He continued his research on the general theory of relativity exploring its implications. And trying to refine its predictions, he also worked on a unified field theory, a theoretical framework that could incorporate all the fundamental forces of nature. This was a difficult task, and Albert did not succeed in completing it. But his efforts stimulated a lot of research and discussion in the scientific community. Albert also became involved in public affairs. He spoke out on many issues such as nuclear disarmament, civil rights, and education. He used his fame to draw attention to these issues and to advocate for peace and justice. He became a respected voice in the public sphere, known for his wisdom and integrity. In the next part, we will learn about Albert's contributions to the World War II effort, his views on the atomic bomb, and his role in the civil rights movement. We will see how he used his scientific knowledge and his moral convictions to make a difference in the world. In his later years, Albert Einstein embarked on a quest that would consume the rest of his scientific career, the search for a unified field theory. This was an attempt to bring together all the fundamental forces of nature into a single theoretical framework. The forces that Albert was trying to unite were gravity which is described by his general theory of relativity and electromagnetism, which is described by Maxwell's equations at the time. These were the only to known fundamental forces. Two more the strong and weak nuclear forces were discovered later. Albert's goal was to find a mathematical formula or a set of equations 
That could explain both gravity and electromagnetism. He believed that this would provide a deeper understanding of the universe and reveal the underlying unity of nature. This was a highly ambitious project, and it was fraught with difficulties. The theories of gravity and electromagnetism are very different in their structure and their concepts. They describe different phenomena and operate on different scales. Bridging the gap between them was a major challenge, despite his best efforts. Albert did not succeed in finding a unified field theory. His ideas did not fit with the experimental data, and they did not gain acceptance. In the scientific community, many physicists were moving in a different direction towards quantum mechanics, a new theory that seemed to explain the behavior of atoms and particles better than classical physics. Although Albert's quest for a unified field theory was unsuccessful, it was not a waste of time. It stimulated a lot of research and discussion. It pushed the boundaries of theoretical physics. And opened up new avenues of investigation. It inspired many scientists to think about the unity of nature and the beauty of the universe, even in his failure. Albert showed us the value of bold ideas, the importance of perseverance, and the power of the human mind. He showed us that science is a journey, not a destination, and that the search for truth is its own reward. While Albert Einstein. Is most famous for his scientific achievements. His impact goes far beyond the realm of physics. In his later years, Albert became a vocal advocate for peace, human rights, and social justice, using his global fame to shed light on issues he cared deeply about. Albert was a lifelong pacifist. He was deeply affected by the destruction and suffering caused by World War One, and he believed. That war was not a solution to international conflicts. He once said, "Peace cannot be kept by force; it can only be achieved by understanding." Albert was a member of several peace organizations, and he often spoke out against war and militarism. However, when World War II broke out, Albert faced a difficult decision. He was aware of the Nazi regime's efforts to develop atomic weapons. And he was worried about the consequences if they succeeded. In 1939, Albert signed a letter to President Roosevelt, warning him about this danger and urging him to support research into atomic energy. In the United States, this letter played a role in the creation of the Manhattan Project, which developed the atomic bomb after the war. When the devastating power of atomic weapons. Became clear, Albert regretted his involvement. He became a strong advocate for nuclear disarmament and for the peaceful use of atomic energy. He worked with other scientists to raise awareness about the dangers of nuclear weapons and to promote international cooperation in the control of atomic energy. Albert was also a champion of civil rights. He was appalled by the racism he saw in the United States. And he used his voice to condemn it. He was a friend of Paul Robeson and W. E. B. Duber, prominent black leaders and civil rights activists. He also spoke out in support of the newly formed State of Israel, seeing it as a refuge for Jews who had suffered persecution in Europe. In his final years, Albert continued to work on his scientific research, but he also devoted a lot of time to his social. And political activities. He passed away in 1955, leaving behind a rich legacy of scientific discovery, social activism, and humanist values. In the next chapter, we will reflect on Albert's life and legacy, and we will see how his ideas continue to influence our world today. We will explore his enduring contributions to science, his impact on society. And his role as a symbol of human curiosity and creativity. Chapter six: Einstein's legacy. Albert Einstein was more than just a brilliant scientist. He became a cultural icon, a symbol of genius and creativity that has endured long after his death. His image with the wild hair and the expressive eyes 
is instantly recognizable and has been reproduced in countless ways. In popular culture, Albert's race to fame was largely due to his groundbreaking scientific work, particularly his general theory of relativity. The theory's confirmation in 1919 through the solar eclipse experiment made headlines around the world and catapulted Albert into the limelight. He was hailed as a scientific hero, a man whose genius had unlocked new secrets of the universe. But Albert's fame was not just about his scientific achievements. It was also about his personality, his beliefs, and his way of life. Albert was known for his humility, his sense of humor, and his nonconformist attitudes. He was a pacifist, a humanitarian, and a champion of civil rights. He was seen as a free thinker, a man who questioned authority and followed his own path. These qualities resonated with many people and made Albert a popular figure. His image was used in advertisements, cartoons, and films. His courts were shared and cherished. His life story was told and retold in books, documentaries, and biographies. Albert became a symbol of the scientist as a creative thinker, a seeker of truth and a servant of humanity. Even today, Albert's influence in popular culture is still strong. He is often referenced in movies, TV shows, music, and literature. His theories are explored in science fiction and speculative fiction. His image is used in art design and fashion. His ideas are taught in schools and debated in universities. Albert's enduring popularity is a testament to his unique combination of scientific brilliance and humanist values. It shows that we admire not only his mind, but also his heart. We see in him a model of what it means to be a scientist and a human being in the next part. We will explore Albert's legacy in the field of science. We will see how his theories have shaped our understanding of the universe and how his spirit of curiosity and wonder continues to inspire scientists and researchers today. Albert Einstein's contributions to science have left a profound and lasting impact on our understanding of the universe, his theories, and ideas have revolutionized the field of physics and continue to shape scientific research today. Albert's most famous contribution is undoubtedly the theory of relativity, which includes the special theory of relativity and the general theory of relativity. The special theory of relativity published in 1905 introduced the world to the concept that space and time are interconnected as a single entity known as spacetime. It also proposed the famous equation E equals McCarrot 2, which states that energy is equal to mass m times the speed of light. C squared, this equation reveal the enormous amount of energy that could be released from a small amount of matter, a discovery that would later pave the way for the development of nuclear energy. The general theory of relativity published in 1915 is a theory of gravity that describes gravity as a curvature of spacetime caused by mass and energy. It replaced Newton's law of universal gravitation and accurately predicted the bending of light around massive objects, the precession of the perihelion of Mercury, and the existence of black holes and gravitational waves, all of which have been confirmed by observations and experiments. In addition to relativity, Albert also made significant contributions to the field of quantum mechanics. He proposed the concept of the photon, or the particle of light, and explained the photoelectric effect, which is the emission of electrons from a material. When it is exposed to light, this work earned him the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1921. Albert's contributions to science go beyond his own research. He played a crucial role in the development of quantum mechanics by challenging its principles and prompting debates that lead to a deeper understanding of the theory. He also inspired countless scientists and researchers with his creativity, 
his curiosity and his relentless pursuit of knowledge. Albert's legacy in science is immense. His theories have expanded our understanding of the universe. From the smallest particles to the largest galaxies, they have led to numerous technological advancements and have influenced many areas of science, including cosmology, particle physics, and nuclear physics. Albert Einstein was not only a brilliant scientist, but also a devoted humanitarian. His philosophies extended beyond the laboratory and the lecture hall, encompassing a deep prospect for all human life and a firm belief in the power of peaceful cooperation. Albert's humanitarian philosophy was shaped by his experiences and his observations of the world around him, witnessing the devastation of World War I and the Second, and the rise of nuclear weaponry deeply impacted him. He was outspoken against the senseless violence of war and advocated for global disarmament. His famous quote, I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War I V will be fought with sticks and stones, reflects his fear of the devastating potential of nuclear weapons. Believing in the common dignity of old people, Albert was also an advocate for civil rights and racial equality in the United States. He spoke out against racism and segregation and was a supporter of the civil rights movement. His correspondence with leaders like the Bibi, Dubai and Paul Rosen demonstrates his commitment to racial justice. Albert also believed in the importance of education and the pursuit of truth. He saw science not just as a tool for understanding the universe, but also as a way to promote critical thinking and curiosity, he encouraged young people to question everything and to never lose their sense of wonder in the realm of international politics. Albert championed the idea of a global community. He was a supporter of the United Nations and believed that international cooperation was the key to addressing global problems like war poverty and disease. He envisioned the world where nations work together for the common good, respecting the rights and freedoms of all people. Albert Einstein's legacy as a humanitarian is as profound as his contributions to science, his compassion, his courage, and his commitment to peace and justice continue to inspire people around the world. His life reminds us that science and humanism can go hand in hand and that the pursuit of knowledge should be guided by a deep prospect for all life. As we close this book, we reflect on the extraordinary life of Albert Einstein, a curious boy who became a groundbreaking scientist, a cultural icon and a devoted humanitarian. His story is a testament to the power of curiosity, the beauty of science, and the potential within all of us to change the world. Thanks for watching and see you soon. Don't forget your like and share. Hello everyone. Welcome to this A2 English listening practice video. You can use this video to improve your listening and comprehension skills as I speak. Are you ready today? I'm going to talk about travel. Traveling is one of the most enjoyable activities. I've always loved traveling. When I was young, my family and I traveled to Hawaii many times. In case you're not familiar with Hawaii, it's an island located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and is also one of the 50 states of the U.S. I've been there about six or seven times, though I don't remember the exact number. It's definitely one of my favorite places in the world. Hawaii has plenty of beautiful beaches and the lifestyle there is slow and calm. However, even though Hawaii is one of my favorite travel destinations in general, I prefer the countryside, forests, or mountains over the beach. I love taking camping trips and road trips. I've taken several road trips through the U.S. in the past, and recently, I had the incredible experience of a road trip through the Tuscany region of Italy. Trust me, if you ever get the chance to go to Italy, I highly recommend renting a car and driving through Tuscany. You won't be disappointed. Prince Princess and a Dragon Sounds like a classic fairy tale. 
But this time the fairy tale gets totally flipped. The prince doesn't save his princess. Instead he throws her into the mouth of the beast. Today we're learning English with Damsel, a new 2024 Netflix movie. In this scene we selected for you. You will see a young couple just getting to know each other. As they take a stroll in the royal garden, Millie Bobby Brown, who you Stranger Things fans might recognize. The actress who plays the princess in this movie comes from the UK so. You can indulge yourself in the beautiful British accent. The actor who plays the prince is American though. And he's trying his best to sound British. So I have a challenge for you. Can you spot the three words, the pronunciation of which gives away his American origin? Every week, we help you understand your favorite movies and TV series without getting lost, without missing the jokes, and without subtitles. So if you are new here to our channel, please subscribe and hit the bell down below. So you never miss any of our newest lessons. Now let's have a walk in this royal garden, shall we? Do you have any questions of me? Questions of what subjects? You may choose the subject. What do you think about me? Pardon. Well, you seem to suggest at best, which is your prerogative. But I'd like to know if the person that I'm being guilted into marrying truly likes me or not. If my attitude offends you, I do apologize. It was not my intent. However, I was unaware that, um, you were being guilted into anything. The land where I come from is exactly how your mother explained. Harsh and barren. This union will save us. I've made my peace with it. My happiness is a small price to pay. For the future of my people is something wrong. So Kasania. Do you know what the title of this movie damsel means? Actually, no. So this is a word that's used in a very specific context. As far as I know, maybe it's an older word where we say damsel in distress. So you might think of Princess Peach from Mario or any fairy tale movie we watch, right? There's a princess, maybe Shrek right there. There's like Fiona is the damsel in the tower. The top of the tower, they're kind of doing a parody on that. Damsel in distress is what we hear. So if someone is in distress, that means that they are in a difficult situation. And damsel basically means, I think. It's like a maid or like a young woman in this case. Oh, okay. So it's like... Because the movie is about this young girl and a dragon. So in a classic fairy tale, it would be prince saving her. But this is a nice more empowered princess, right? Yeah, every young girl would love it. I highly recommend this to all of you. Show this movie to your kids. My daughter really enjoyed it. And after watching this movie, she would play as if she was wearing a sword. You know with her and like... You know slaying dragons, she really enjoyed it. That's so cute, what do you think about me? First of all, Ethan, this phrase if she was an American actress, she would pronounce, what do you think about me? Yeah, what are you? We explained it so many times in all of our lessons. Disconnected speech in this coloration. What do you would transfer in, what are you? But here we don't hear it like that. We hear, what do you think about me? Yeah, what do you think about me? What do you think about me? Here in the what we have the stop T what, but then she starts saying do what do. What do you think about me? And in the word about we have another stop T here. And an interesting word here. I would ask you to define it um. After this question, the prince asks her pardon. Pardon. What does mean pardon? It's very British sounding. Yeah. By the way. Saying pardon in the state's word price say more sorry. But it's just a way to say excuse me. Or what did you say this is even really nice. I used to recommend it to my students instead of saying I didn't understand a lot of learners. When someone says something and they don't understand. They say I didn't understand. And it sounds very much like you're an English learner. You don't understand because of the English. But if you want to sound more colloquial, you want to sound more confidence, you can say sorry. That accused the other person to repeat what they said. Well, you seem disinterested at best. 
which is your prerogative, but I'd like to know if the person that I'm being guilted into marrying truly likes me or not. This sentence is just packed with vocabulary, right? So the first word is disinterested, yeah, so. It's a very common word to be interested in something, but when you are disinterested, it means that you are not interested or you don't care, right, you each? But Ethan, let me ask you this. When you hear this word, do you understand it is like not interested or there is another meaning to this word, which means unbiased, what comes first for you? Disinterested when you hear this word, yeah, in this context, I would understand it is not interested. Nowadays it, it doesn't sound like such a common word. I probably would say apathetic, maybe meaning that you, you don't feel a strong, a strong feeling either way. Positively or negative that you're apathetic. But what does she mean when she says disinterested? At best, at best means in the best scenario. Which would be in the best cases, but maybe it's even worse. That's the disinterested at worst. He might absolutely hate her or think she's horrible. And that she uses the word prerogative? She says it's your prerogative. Uh, think of it as a special right or privilege that someone has right. And since he's a prince, I believe, ha ha ha, yeah. So he can decide, yeah, what to say, how to behave being the prince. But there is another phrase which is really interested. Be guilted into something, yeah. She's being guilted into marrying, could you define that? Yeah, if someone guilts you into something, they make you feel emotionally bad if you don't do what they want you to do. I don't know if we'd actually say this in English and Spanish. They would call it like emotional blackmail. So blackmail is when you threaten someone with a piece of information you know about them, but emotional blackmail is the same as being guilted into something. So you wouldn't use this phrase like I was guilty into the doing this. I would yaho. My parents, that happens all the time. When you're younger, is your parents guilty and and when you're older, your parents guilty you into doing things you don't want to do. That's exactly that this case. When you don't want to do something, but someone else, usually your parents or your teachers, tell you that that's the right thing to do. You should do that so you kind of feel obliged. You feel guilty, I'll teach you. A more colloquial, modern way to say this is to guilt trip someone. To guilt trip, that means the same thing. I'm interested in this grammar thing here. So she's I'm being guilted. We see here passive voice. So yeah. Whether said that not she's not the doer of the action, but the action is directed at her yes. She is being guilted a. And the present continuous tense shows that the action is happening at this very moment. At present yet this longer period of time guys, if you want a better Memorize all the new words that you are learning today. Download the Real Life English app. There we have something special for you. A deck of flashcards with all the expressions from today's lesson. The advanced technology that we're using on the app helps you learn the vocabulary in the most efficient way. And the coolest part is you can always put your learning into practice by having short English conversations with other English learners. You will find the link to download the real life English app in the description to this video. If my attitude offends you, I do apologize. It was not my intent. I found that the words intent and intention are synonymous. Yeah, but with a subtle difference. Yeah, intense. When I hear that, I think of a legal setting. That they're trying to show that the person who is guilty or maybe not guilty, but the person who they believe is guilty had intent, meaning they had the intention to do that thing, which means that basically they wanted to do that thing. Obviously, they're trying to use a more formal or older sounding English. If I were to say this, I would say it was not my intention yet or I or I didn't mean to do that. Or I didn't mean to say that. I didn't mean to offend you. Yeah, that's even more, more informal, even more cloaker. If you say I didn't mean to, however, 
I was unaware that um, you were being gilded into anything. Unaware is just like having no clue, having no idea what's going on. It's just like a fancier way to say I didn't know that. If you want to say the opposite to, you can say I'm aware. If someone's saying something that you already know, and especially if you I think, it's a bit emphatic of it being something obvious, like I'm aware. I'm already aware I already know that harsh and barren. I liked how she again. Yo says her British charm and describes a your land as harsh and barren. So we don't hear this rhotic American are harsh yeah. We would pronounce it with you as harsh, but she says harsh harsh and bearing. They're very similar these words harsh and bearing. This is something like very rough, empty without any sign of life. Like if you imagine a desert or a rocky mountain, right? That would be harsh and barren, but there are some interesting calcations. With both of these words, we could say a harsh climate. A harsh voice to be harsh on someone, like you're harsh on your children, ah. But barren we use more with places, right? A barren landscape, a barren desert. Barren soil, which means that if you think about that, with like a barren desert or barren soil, it's a place where you can't grow anything. It's it's dead in other words. It would be nice for our viewers to remember those collocations and just reminding you guys. Always learn words in collocations in context, yeah. Not just individual words. I was gonna say about harsh is that often. This is used in a cloaker way. As sort of an exaggeration, but when maybe you have two friends and one sort of criticize the other one, you could say harsho. What does it mean? It means the same as like we said here, but you know you're, you're using it as sort of like a friendly, like, oh, you know, that was a harsh criticism, but we just use it just by itself like harsh. That was rude. You may say this union will save us. I've made my peace with it. I think they used really fancy language here. She instead of like, I agree to, I agree to it, or I came to terms with it. She says, I've made my peace with it. So to make your peace, it means that you already accept something. Even though maybe it's not what you originally wanted, or it's not something that you're particularly happy about. But this is quite common nowadays too. To say make one's peace with it. So we don't hear this rhotic American are harsh, yeah. We would pronounce it with you as harsh, but she says harsh, harsh, and bearing. They're very similar, these words harsh and bearing. This is something like very rough, empty without any sign of life. Like if you imagine a desert or a rocky mountain, right? That would be harsh and barren, but there are some interesting calcations. With both of these words, we could say a harsh climate, a harsh voice to be harsh on someone, like you're harsh on your children, ah. But barren we use more with places, right? A barren landscape, a barren desert. Barren soil, which means that if you think about that, with like a barren desert or barren soil, it's a place where you can't grow anything. It's, it's dead in other words. It would be nice for our viewers to remember those collocations and just reminding you guys. Always learn words in collocations in context, yeah. Not just individual words. I was gonna say about harsh is that often. This is used in a cloaker way. As sort of an exaggeration, but when maybe you have two friends. And one sort of criticize the other one. You could say harsho. What does it mean? It means the same as like we said here, but you know you're, you're using it as sort of like a friendly, kidding sort of way of like, oh, you know, that was a harsh criticism, but we just use it just by itself like harsh. That was rude. You may say this union will save us. I've made my peace with it. I think they used really fancy language here. She instead of like, I agree to, I agree to it, or I came to terms with it. She says, I've made my peace with it. So to make your peace, it means that you already accept something. Even though maybe it's not what you originally wanted, or it's not something that you're particularly happy about. 
But this is quite common nowadays too, to say make one's peace with it. As you pointed out in the intro, this actor really gives away that he is an American. Here I could instantly hear a change in accent. And it seemed really out of place, so one thing is in letter. Which British should be like letter right? Yeah, where you have the radic R and maybe he had the. Maybe he was okay with the R but he said a very strong American T letter. Letter the letter you sent, so it was a weird mix. Because he's sort of speaking British. And then you have like a very American sounding word, yeah, and then he. Said also advance in advance in advance few arrival. I would say in advance, but how would a British person say that? Yeah, the British variant would be in advance. That's why some students ask me, which accent do you speak Cernia? And I honestly respond that sometimes I mix both. Because some words are just like, you know learned in their British pronunciation. So we have these commonly used words like ask, answer back path, which in American English would sound like ask. Answer back path like a dance, dance as I hear he makes this slip, yeah. It makes this mistake and instead of in advance, he says in advance nice. I think there's some other parts of the scene as well. Where he had a one of those slips, as you called it. But let me define the word. Flower is an easy one. Because everyone can imagine a flower. So if anything has a pattern, like a piece of clothes or a piece of furniture, you can say flowery, but in this context, um, he meant her language. The language was flowery, what does it mean? It means that you used fancy words like. And sometimes it has a negative connotation, yeah. Like his speech was too flowery, just be simple, yeah. Use simpler words. Thought it was some sort of provincial insignia. Okay, and here comes this third instance. When he suddenly switches to American accent, instead of saying, I thought it was some sort of provincial insignia. Or sort of sort of provincial insignia, he says sort of like really American way again. With here this flafty sort of thought. It was some sort of provincial insignia. And to be honest, I had to check up what provincial insignia is. Uh, do you know what it is, Ethan? I do it, but it's so. It's not something I would recommend loners. Even bother learning because it's just so fancy. And like so it's a piece of jargon, meaning that it's for very specific situation. Yeah, it sounds very old fashioned. But provincial means that it's from a province. Literally, but it probably means that it's from like the countryside, for example. Not from a city and an insignia is like a coat of arms or some sort of symbol that might be used to show. For example, that something comes from a house. From a certain house of lords, hold on it's a maze, isn't it? You know one of Myra's dreams is to actually get lost in these green maze. You can see in royal gardens in Britain. Uh. And here is another maze, the one you would uh, find on paper and you would track a line from the beginning to the end, right? We also call this a labyrinth, labyrinth, another word. Yeah, but here we have this tech question and for me, the tech question, isn't it always sounds so British? So like here, it would be very appropriate American English too. It's amazing, isn't it? But there is a use of isn't it? In British English, that's more, more British that Americans wouldn't use. So they'll use it for like kind of confirming saying. They'll say and they'll even reducing more to in it. In it, in it, here we have this reduction of. We have a schwa sound, right? Is a, isn't it? And then um. Isn't it T is a stop T. We don't hear it as the end of the phrase, isn't it? Isn't it? I used to make them for Floria when she was little. Another common of the Caucasian. I used to make them for Floria when she was little. I used to do something. It means that in the past you were doing something, but now you stop doing. And students often confuse us with another phrase. I'm used to something, or I'm used to doing something. That has another meaning. That means that you have a habit of doing something. For example, I'm used to getting up early right. And again, this beautiful British accent of the princess. 
She says little little instead of little yeah. Or sometimes the British might pronounce it like, with a stop D like little little right. That'd be more of a Cockney accent saying little, m m hum yeah. It's just them giving me space Ethan. Let me ask you to comment on this grammar thing here. Is it something informal to use or is just like normal? So he's saying this is them giving me space. I'm interested more in this them pronounce them. Not they so you'd have to say it. They are giving me space. Would be another way to say this. But because he's talking about the situation, I think it becomes that. They're the object of the sentence, in this case. So he's talking about the situation of the distance. This the speaker is the subject. This is them giving me space. So them is the object. I believe that's what's happening here. So and even the intonation there. It's interesting that he doesn't say this is. He says this is them giving mistakes, yeah. Because he emphasizes it, he's emphasizing right. I saw some horses being left unattended at the stables. An interesting word unattended. I think I heard it at the airport. Please don't leave your bag baggage unattended. Yeah, hear it in the same context. Yeah, yeah. The horses are unintended at the stables. I think she says stables is the place where the horses basically spend their time. They sleep when people aren't riding them. And if something is unattended, it's not being attended to, meaning that it's not being watched in that moment. Would you say is it? Is it a formal word, or it's pretty normal to use it in daily conversations? I think like you said, it's like, at the airport is the most common place to hear this. And students often confuse us with another phrase. I'm used to something, or I'm used to doing something. That has another meaning. That means that you have a habit of doing something. For example, I'm used to getting up early right. And again, this beautiful British accent of the princess. She says little little instead of little yeah. Or sometimes the British might pronounce it like, with a stop D like little little right. That'd be more of a Cockney accent saying little, m m hum yeah. It's just them giving me space Ethan. Let me ask you to comment on this grammar thing here. Is it something informal to use or is just like normal? So he's saying this is them giving me space. I'm interested more in this them pronounce them. Not they so you'd have to say it, they are giving me space. Would be another way to say this. But because he's talking about the situation, I think it becomes that. They're the object of the sentence, in this case. So he's talking about the situation of the distance. This the speaker is the subject. This is them giving me space. So them is the object. I believe that's what's happening here. So and even the intonation there. It's interesting that he doesn't say this is. He says this is them giving mistakes, yeah, because he emphasizes it, he's emphasizing right. I saw some horses being left unattended at the stables. An interesting word unattended. I think I heard it at the airport. Please don't leave your bag baggage unattended. Yeah, hear it in the same context, yeah, yeah. The horses are unattended at the stables. I think she says stables is the place where the horses basically spend their time. They sleep when people aren't riding them. And if something is unattended, it's not being attended to, meaning that it's not being watched in that moment. Would you say is it, is it a formal word, or it's pretty normal to use it in daily conversations? I think like you said, it's like, at the airport is the most common place to hear this. Is something wrong? It's just in the letter you sent in advance for your arrival. You sounded different. Different in what way? Far more, um, flowery. Maybe that's because my stepmother dictated most of it. And my sister's idea was the heart. Heart. Thought it was some sort of provincial insignia. Actually drew this. Hold on, it's a maze. Isn't it? I hope that you will get to know my heart. That is very clever. I used to make them for Floria when she was little. May I ask you another question? Certainly. Do they always follow you so closely? It's just them giving me space. That must be tiring. It is actually. I saw some horses being left unattended at the stables. 
Do you write? Thank you so much for learning with us today. And the right thing to do now is to go through all the expressions one more time. If you enjoy learning English with movies like Damsel, you can watch this lesson next. That's what the monster called me, Mom. What's happening? You are half blood, and half bloods are not safe in the world. Once they reach a certain age and they begin to understand what they are, terrible forces are drawn to them, driven to harm them, before they can become strong enough to fight back. That is what you have been. This is Vaya. Thank you and see you later. Welcome back to Learn English with Vaya. I'm Octavia, a TESOL certified English teacher. I teach English online to students who are learning it as a second language. In today's episode, let's delve into English vocabulary. If you've been studying English for some time, you're aware that English words can have multiple uses and meanings, which can be challenging to comprehend. It's crucial to expose yourself to the language adequately to fully grasp the various meanings, expressions, and phrases. It's essential to expose yourself to them. This exposure allows you to comprehend what a native speaker intends to convey and empowers you to use them appropriately in context. One word that exemplifies this is blow. Blow can function as a verb, a phrasal verb, and a noun. Today, I'll explore the different meanings of blow and its variations, such as blow through, blow on, blow down, blow up, and blow out. Each of these has distinct interpretations. They indeed have multiple meanings, which can be a bit perplexing. However, fret not, as we will delve into the specifics and provide you with examples of their usage. So let's begin. We'll start with the word blow, and the definition to keep in mind throughout this episode is that it pertains to the movement of air. The primary verb definition of blow revolves around the movement of air. For instance, when watching a weather report, you might hear about strong winds blowing or a gentle breeze blowing through a region. The person giving the weather update might mention that the wind will blow forcefully tonight, indicating that there will be a significant amount of wind causing the movement of air. Similarly, during a storm, you may hear about strong winds blowing in a particular area. It can also be used to describe the current situation when the wind is blowing vigorously, emphasizing the movement of air. Furthermore, blow can be used when expelling air. For example, if you're chewing bubble gum and create bubbles by expelling air, you can say that you're blowing bubbles. Likewise, when a child uses soap and water to create bubbles by blowing air into them, they are also expelling air to form the bubbles. Absolutely. Another way to use blow as a verb is to indicate messing something up or missing out on an opportunity. This usage is often heard in movies and television shows when a character is engaged in a stressful, risky, or high-stakes situation. For instance, you might come across a scene where a character says, "Don't blow this," or "I don't want to blow this." In such cases, it means "Don't mess this up," or "I don't want to miss out on this opportunity." Here are a couple of examples to illustrate this usage. Let's say someone is going for a job interview and they desperately need the job and the income since they are currently unemployed. They might express their concern by saying, "I don't want to blow this interview." Now imagine that their job interview is the final round of a highly competitive selection process. They might feel the pressure and say, "This is my chance to secure the position. I can't afford to blow it." Absolutely, in the scenario where someone wakes up late and realizes they missed their job interview, they might express their disappointment by saying, "I really blew this chance," indicating that they missed out on the opportunity and made a significant mistake. Similarly, The expression "I don't want to blow this" or "I don't want to blow this chance" can be used when someone is going on a date with someone they really like. In this context, it means they don't want to make a mistake or do something that would make the other person not like them. They want to make a good first impression. Now let's explore "blow" as a noun. When used as a noun, it means to get hit by something, usually with significant force. For example, in a boxing match, when two boxers are fighting each other in the ring, 
They can deliver blows to each other, meaning they hit each other with forceful punches. Let's consider a scenario where two individuals are engaged in a physical altercation. In this situation, one person delivers a punch to the other's face, causing them to fall to the ground. We can describe this event by stating that the boxer fell down after receiving a blow to the jaw or face. This blow refers to the punch that was inflicted by the other boxer, resulting in the person being struck. Similarly, in TV shows and movies, you may come across instances where someone is struck in the head by an object. For example, if an object accidentally falls and hits someone on the head, they might exclaim, I took a blow to the head or I received a blow to the head. These phrases indicate that the person was hit on the head and experienced the impact of the object falling on them. Now, let's move on to discussing the phrasal verbs that incorporate the word blow. We'll begin with the ones that have a single definition, which makes them relatively easier to understand. As we progress, you'll notice that they become slightly more complex. As we continue, let's explore the phrasal verb blow down, which is relatively straightforward. When we talk about blow down, we are referring to something falling over due to the force of the wind or air. It's important to keep this definition in mind as we delve into the other phrasal verbs, as you'll notice that the concept of air movement is a recurring theme. For example, during a severe storm with strong winds, you can say that the wind is so powerful that it might blow down trees. In the past tense, if multiple trees actually fell due to the wind, you can say that the wind blew down those trees. So, blow down or blew down in the past tense signifies that the trees toppled because of the force of the wind. Moving on to the next phrasal verb, blow on, it is also quite straightforward and has only one definition. This phrase describes the action of directing ear onto a surface. When we talk about the phrasal verb blow on, we mean the action of pushing air onto the surface of something. Let's consider an example. Suppose you have just finished painting your nails. Initially, they are wet and they need time to dry. If you want to expedite the drying process, you can blow on them. This means you position your nails in front of your mouth and release air onto their surface. So, you can say, I'm blowing on my nails to help them dry faster. Moving on to the third phrasal verb, blow up, it has three definitions. Let's begin with the first one, which refers to something bursting or exploding. For instance, if you have a balloon and you inflate it by blowing air into it, eventually, if you continue to do so, it will become overfilled with air and pressure, causing it to blow up or burst open. This concept also applies to explosive devices like bombs. You frequently encounter this usage in TV shows and movies. That's a great way to visualize and contextualize the definitions. Let's continue exploring the usage of blow up in different contexts. Firstly, in TV shows or movies, when there is a bomb present and there is a risk of it detonating, you may hear the characters say that the bomb is about to blow up, indicating that it is about to explode. The phrase blow up is also used when referring to the demolition of buildings. In construction work, particularly in places like Las Vegas where old casinos are replaced with new ones, explosive devices are sometimes used to bring down the old structures. For example, you can say the demolition team blew up the building to make way for the construction of the new casino. The second definition of blow up pertains to intense anger. When you become extremely angry, you may experience a sudden urge to express or release that anger. Just like something exploding or bursting, it can manifest as wanting to yell or even throw something in the heat of the moment. By understanding these various contexts, we can grasp the different ways in which the phrasal verb blow up is used. Indeed, that's an accurate portrayal of blowing up when it comes to expressing intense anger. The feeling of anger builds up within a person, and eventually, it reaches a point where it erupts or comes out, resulting in a blow-up. For instance, let's consider a situation where someone loses all the files on their computer due to a virus or hacking incident. They invest hours trying to rectify the issue and retrieve their files, but their efforts prove futile, frustrated, and overwhelmed. 
If they react by throwing their computer across the room, we can say that they blew up. In this context, blowing up signifies an explosive and dramatic reaction fueled by frustration and anger. The third way to use blow up as a phrasal verb is to describe a rapid increase in something, particularly in size. Absolutely, the third way to use blow up as a phrasal verb is to describe a rapid increase in stature, fame, or popularity. It can be applied to various scenarios, including inflating a balloon, pumping air into a tire, or even expanding an inflatable bouncy house. In these cases, blowing up refers to the act of adding air, causing the object to increase in size. Moreover, blow up can also be used to describe a surge in fame or popularity, particularly when discussing celebrities, musicians, actors, and similar figures. For instance, you could say Taylor Swift really blew up this year, indicating that her popularity and presence in the media significantly increased. This can be observed through her frequent appearances on magazine covers and television. Similarly, you could use this phrase to express the sudden rise in someone's career, such as saying Timoth Chalamet's career really blew up this year. Indeed, you provided great examples of how blow up can be used to describe a rapid increase in fame, popularity, career success, or even financial improvement. When it comes to bands, if they release an album, go on tour, have their music played on the radio, and make appearances on TV shows, you can say that the band is blowing up or has blown up, indicating that they are experiencing a significant surge in popularity. Similarly, in the context of financial situations, you can use blow up to describe a rapid increase in the value of something, such as stock prices. For example, you can say, the price of Apple stock blew up after the invention of the iPhone. This means that the price of Apple stock increased rapidly following the release of the iPhone, as more people started buying iPhones and using Apple products, leading to a surge in the stock price. Now, let's move on to the next phrasal verb blow through. Certainly, the phrasal verb blow through can indeed refer to the movement of air through an object, particularly when the object has openings or is porous. Without such openings, air cannot pass through, so the concept of blowing through wouldn't apply. Let's consider an example using trees. Trees have branches and leaves, but they are not completely solid. When it's windy outside and you observe the branches and leaves of a tree moving, you can say that the wind is blowing through the trees. This suggests that the air is passing through the openings in the tree, causing the branches and leaves to sway. Similarly, in a garden or a meadow, if there's a breeze and you notice the grass moving, you can say that the wind is blowing through the grass. This indicates that the air is flowing through the open spaces between the blades of grass. In both cases, the phrasal verb blow through is used to describe the movement of air through an object or natural element with openings or porosity. Indeed, you provided additional examples of how blow through can be used in different contexts. One way to use blow through is to describe the movement of air through objects like plants, leaves, or even hair. For instance, if you're standing outside in the wind and your hair is being moved by the air flowing through the individual strands, you can say that the wind is blowing through your hair. This conveys the idea that the wind is passing through and causing your hair to sway or move. The second way to use blow through is to describe being reckless or not stopping when you should. For example, if a driver approaches a stop sign but fails to stop and instead continues driving without looking both ways, you can say that the driver blew through the stop sign. This implies that the driver disregarded the requirement to stop and potentially put themselves and others at risk. Another example could involve waiting for a train. If the train is supposed to stop at the station where you are, but instead it continues past the station without stopping, you can say that the train blew through the station. This suggests that the train did not adhere to the scheduled stop and proceeded without stopping as expected. In both cases, blow through is used metaphorically to describe actions that involve not following the appropriate course of action or disregarding set rules or instructions. Absolutely, the third way to use blow through as a phrasal verb is to describe going through something quickly. 
often implying speed or recklessness. In the context of taking an exam, if a student completes the exam in a remarkably short time, you can say that they blew through the exam. This suggests that they went through the exam rapidly. Regardless of whether it indicates recklessness or efficiency, it can imply that the student either hastily provided random answers without careful consideration or that they possessed a high level of intelligence and found the exam to be straightforward and easily manageable. Additionally, blow-through can be used to describe someone spending a significant amount of money quickly and without much consideration. For example, if an individual spends a large sum of money in a short period, you can say that they blew through their money. The second way to use blow-through is to describe being reckless or not stopping when you should. For example, if a driver approaches a stop sign but fails to stop and instead continues driving without looking both ways, you can say that the driver blew through the stop sign. This implies that the driver disregarded the requirement to stop and potentially put themselves and others at risk. Another example could involve waiting for a train. If the train is supposed to stop at the station where you are, but instead it continues past the station without stopping, you can say that the train blew through the station. This suggests that the train did not adhere to the scheduled stop and proceeded without stopping as expected. In both cases, blow-through is used metaphorically to describe actions that involve not following the appropriate course of action or disregarding set rules or instructions. Absolutely, the third way to use blow-through as a phrasal verb is to describe going through something quickly, often implying speed or recklessness. In the context of taking an exam, if a student completes the exam in a remarkably short time, you can say that they blew through the exam. This suggests that they went through the exam rapidly, regardless of whether it indicates recklessness or efficiency. It can imply that the student either hastily provided random answers without careful consideration or that they possessed a high level of intelligence and found the exam to be straightforward and easily manageable. Additionally, blow-through can be used to describe someone spending a significant amount of money quickly and without much consideration. For example, if an individual spends a large sum of money in a short period, you can say that they blew through their money. The same concept applies to blowing out birthday candles. When people have candles on top of their birthday cake, they need to push the air out of their lungs to extinguish the candles. So, when someone says, it's time to blow out your candles, they are instructing you to use your breath to push the air and cause the candle flames to go out. This movement of air can also be associated with extinguishing a match. If you have a lit match and you want to put it out, you blow on it to extinguish the flame. In this case, you blow the match out using the force of your breath to stop the fire. In summary, blowout can refer to pushing out air, whether it's exhaling at the doctor's office, extinguishing birthday candles, or putting out a match by blowing on it. Absolutely. I apologize for the confusion in my previous response. You are correct in stating that when you blow out a match, you are exhaling and using the force of your breath to extinguish the flame. In addition to the examples you provided, blowout can also refer to the movement of air through a tool or device. For instance, a leaf blower is a tool that gardeners use to clean up yards. It pushes air through the device, which in turn moves or blows the leaves, debris, and other materials in the yard. In this context, Blowing out refers to the movement of the leaves caused by the forceful air from the leaf blower. Another meaning of blowout is to rupture or break due to excessive pressure. This is often used when referring to a tire that bursts while driving. If someone arrives late to your house and explains that they had a blowout on the way, it means that their tire exploded or experienced a significant problem while they were driving. To summarize, Blowout can also mean the forceful movement of air through a tool like a leaf blower and the rupture or bursting of a tire due to excessive pressure. The same concept applies to blowing out birthday candles. When people have candles on top of their birthday cake, they need to push the air out of their lungs to extinguish the candles. So, when someone says, it's time to blow out your candles, they are instructing you to use your breath to push the air and cause the candle flames to go out. This movement of air can also be associated with extinguishing a match. 
If you have a lit match and you want to put it out, you blow on it to extinguish the flame. In this case, you blow the match out using the force of your breath to stop the fire. In summary, blowout can refer to pushing out air, whether it's exhaling at the doctor's office, extinguishing birthday candles, or putting out a match by blowing on it, absolutely. I apologize for the confusion in my previous response. You are correct in stating that when you blow out a match, you are exhaling and using the force of your breath to extinguish the flame. In addition to the examples you provided, blowout can also refer to the movement of air through a tool or device. For instance, a leaf blower is a tool that gardeners use to clean up yards. It pushes air through the device, which in turn moves or blows the leaves, debris, and other materials in the yard. In this context, blowing out refers to the movement of the leaves caused by the forceful air from the leaf blower. Another meaning of blowout is to rupture or break due to excessive pressure. This is often used when referring to a tire that bursts while driving. If someone arrives late to your house and explains that they had a blowout on the way, it means that their tire exploded or experienced a significant problem while they were driving. To summarize, blowout can also mean the forceful movement of air through a tool like a leaf blower and the rupture or bursting of a tire due to excessive pressure. The same concept applies to blowing out birthday candles. When people have candles on top of their birthday cake, they need to push the air out of their lungs to extinguish the candles. So, when someone says, it's time to blow out your candles, they are instructing you to use your breath to push the air and cause the candle flames to go out. This movement of air can also be associated with extinguishing a match. If you have a lit match and you want to put it out, you blow on it to extinguish the flame. In this case, you blow the match out using the force of your breath to stop the fire. In summary, blowout can refer to pushing out air, whether it's exhaling at the doctor's office, extinguishing birthday candles, or putting out a match by blowing on it, absolutely. I apologize for the confusion in my previous response. You are correct in stating that when you blow out a match, you are exhaling and using the force of your breath to extinguish the flame. In addition to the examples you provided, blowout can also refer to the movement of air through a tool or device. For instance, a leaf blower is a tool that gardeners use to clean up yards. It pushes air through the device, which in turn moves or blows the leaves, debris, and other materials in the yard. In this context, Blowing out refers to the movement of the leaves caused by the forceful air from the leaf blower. Another meaning of blowout is to rupture or break due to excessive pressure. This is often used when referring to a tire that bursts while driving. If someone arrives late to your house and explains that they had a blowout on the way, it means that their tire exploded or experienced a significant problem while they were driving. To summarize, Blowout can also mean the forceful movement of air through a tool like a leaf blower and the rupture or bursting of a tire due to excessive pressure. In conversations, greatly aids in understanding the nuances and multiple meanings of words and phrases. Thank you for highlighting these points and emphasizing the importance of context and input in language learning. Thank you for your thoughtful comments and suggestions. I completely agree that exposure to a variety of language input, including phrasal verbs and different meanings for nouns, is crucial for language learning. The more we encounter and interact with these linguistic elements, the better we become at understanding and using them. I appreciate your offer to discuss more phrasal verbs and vocabulary topics in future episodes. If listeners find these discussions helpful and would like to explore more of them, it would be great to continue covering such topics to support English language learning. Thank you for your support and for tuning in until the end. I'm glad the podcast is helping you learn English. And I'm here to assist you with any language-related questions or topics you'd like to explore further. Please kindly consider leaving a review on the app you are using to listen to this podcast or recommending it to a friend or family member. Sharing your thoughts about how amazing and helpful this podcast is, along with how much it has contributed to your English learning journey, would be greatly appreciated. Your support will help us expand our audience. Also, 
Don't forget that you can follow us on social media at Learn English Pod and visit our website at learnenglishpod.com. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing and enabling notifications so you can stay updated when our next episode is released. Until then, keep up the great work in learning English. Patient skills. Regular updates with fresh content. We consistently update our channel with fresh content, ensuring that you have access to the latest and most relevant English language lessons. Why subscribe? Be the first to access our latest videos. By subscribing to our channel, you will be the first to access our newest videos as soon as they are released. Join a community of enthusiastic learners. Join our community of enthusiastic learners who are passionate about mastering the English language. Interact with fellow learners, share experiences, and support one another on this language learning journey. Enhance your learning with our structured approach. Our structured approach to teaching English will help you build a strong foundation and systematically improve your language skills. How to stay updated? Subscribe and turn on notifications. Subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications to receive. Learning English verbs is an essential part of building language proficiency. Today, we will focus on the versatile and creative verb draw. Drawing allows us to express ourselves artistically and communicate visually. In this beginner lesson, we will explore easy English verbs associated with drawing to enhance your English language skills through comprehensible input. Sketch. Sketching is the initial step in creating a drawing. When you sketch, you make a rough, preliminary drawing with light, quick strokes. Sketching helps you plan and outline your artwork before adding details. Trace. Tracing involves copying an existing image by drawing over its lines. This technique is often used to practice and improve drawing skills. You can trace a picture from a book or trace. Over a printed image to create your own rendition. Shade shading adds depth and dimension to a drawing. When you shade, you use different tones to create areas of light and dark. You can shade with a pencil, charcoal, or even with colored pencils to bring your drawing to life. Color coloring is the process of adding colors to a drawing. You can use colored pencils, markers, or paints to add vibrancy and visual interest. Coloring allows you to explore different color combinations and create a mood in your artwork. Blend blending is a technique used to smoothly transition between different colors or shades. When you blend, you use tools such as a blending stump or your fingers to soften edges and create a seamless transition between colors. Erase erasing is an essential part of drawing. When you erase, you remove unwanted lines or mistakes from your artwork. An eraser helps you correct errors and refine your drawing until you achieve the desired result. Outline. Outlining involves drawing the outer shape or contour of an object or subject. When you outline, you create a clear and defined shape that serves as the foundation for your drawing. Outlining helps you establish proportions and structure. Conclusion. Drawing is a fantastic way to develop your English language skills while nurturing your creativity. By mastering verbs like sketch, trace, shade, color, blend, erase, and outline, you can embark on an artistic journey in English. Remember to practice regularly, experiment with different techniques, and enjoy the process of creating visual art, engaging in comprehensible input, where you understand and interact with English through drawing, can significantly enhance your language learning experience. So grab your sketchbook, sharpen your pencils. And let your imagination guide you as you explore the world of drawing in English. Certainly, here are a few more easy English verbs related to drawing. Doodle. Doodling involves drawing random, spontaneous, and often repetitive shapes or patterns. Doodling is a fun and creative way to pass the time and explore your imagination. Fill. Filling refers to coloring or shading inside the lines of a drawing to bring it to life. When you fill, you use colors or shading techniques to add depth and detail to different areas of your artwork. Blend blending can also be applied to colors. When you blend colors, you mix them together smoothly to create a gradual transition or gradient effect.
Blending colors adds richness and depth to your drawing. Sketchbook. A sketchbook is a notebook or pad of paper specifically used for sketching and drawing. It is a place where artists can freely express their ideas, practice their skills, and keep a record of their creative journey. Perspective. Perspective refers to the technique of representing three-dimensional objects on a two-dimensional surface. Understanding perspective helps artists create realistic drawings that convey depth and spatial relationships. Canvas. A canvas is a flat, sturdy surface used for painting or drawing. It is commonly made of stretched fabric or prepared panels. Canvases provide artists with a durable and versatile medium for their artwork. Illustrate. To illustrate means to create visual representations that accompany text or convey a story or concept. Illustrations can be found in books, magazines, and various forms of media. Illustrating allows artists to bring words to life through their drawings. Portray. Portraying involves capturing the likeness or essence of a person, object, or scene in a drawing. When you portray, you aim to depict the subject accurately and convey its unique characteristics. By familiarizing yourself with these additional English verbs related to drawing, you can expand your vocabulary and enhance your artistic skills. Remember to practice regularly, explore different techniques, and embrace the joy of artistic expression. Happy drawing! Certainly, here are a few more English verbs related to drawing. Outline. When you outline, you draw the outermost lines of an object or figure to define its shape. Outlining helps create a clear and recognizable representation. Fill in. To fill in means to add details, texture, or shading to the interior of a drawing. It involves adding depth and dimension to different areas of the artwork. Crosshatch. Crosshatching is a shading technique where you create a pattern of intersecting lines to add depth and texture to a drawing. It involves layering lines in different directions to achieve varying tonal values. Smudge. Smudging involves blending or softening lines or shading by using a finger, blending tool, or tissue. It creates a smooth transition between different areas of a drawing. Depict. To depict means to represent or portray something in a drawing. It involves capturing the essence or characteristics of a subject through visual means. Ink. Inking refers to the process of using ink, such as a pen or brush, to create lines or fill in areas in a drawing. Inking adds boldness and permanence to the artwork. Etch. Etching involves creating lines or designs on a surface, usually by scratching or cutting into it. It can be done on materials like metal, glass, or even wood to create intricate and detailed drawings. Blend colors. Blending colors involves mixing two or more colors together to create new shades or gradients. It allows for smooth color transitions and adds depth and dimension to the artwork. Charcoal. Charcoal is a versatile drawing medium made from burnt wood. It is often used for creating bold and expressive drawings as well as for shading and smudging techniques. Still life. A still life is a drawing or painting that depicts inanimate objects, such as fruits, flowers, or everyday objects. Drawing still life subjects helps develop observational skills and understanding of composition. Remember, practice and experimentation are key to improving your drawing skills. Explore different techniques, subjects, and materials to expand your artistic vocabulary and create unique and expressive artworks. Enjoy the journey of artistic discovery, certainly. Here are a few additional English verbs related to drawing. Drape. Draping involves drawing or rendering fabric or clothing on a figure. It requires understanding how fabric falls, folds, and interacts with the body. Perspective. Perspective is a technique used to create the illusion of depth and three-dimensionality in a drawing. It involves representing objects as they appear in space, taking into account their size, position, and relative distance. Contrast. Contrast refers to the difference between light and dark values in a drawing. It helps create visual interest, depth, and emphasis. Using contrasting tones or colors can make elements stand out or recede in a composition. Sculpt. 
To sculpt in drawing means to create a sense of volume and three-dimensionality through the use of shading and rendering techniques. It involves giving the illusion of form and texture to objects or figures, stipple. Stippling is a technique where you create a pattern of dots to add shading, texture, or tone to a drawing. By varying the density and spacing of the dots, you can achieve different effects and create a sense of depth. Carve. To carve in drawing means to create lines or marks with intention and precision. It involves using controlled strokes to define shapes, textures, or details in a drawing. Ink wash. An ink wash is a technique where you dilute ink with water to create a range of tones and values. It allows for subtle gradations and can be used to add depth and atmosphere to a drawing. Hatching. Hatching is a shading technique where you create parallel lines or strokes to add value and tone to a drawing. It involves varying the spacing and direction of the lines to create different effects. Gesture. Gesture drawing focuses on capturing the essence and movement of a subject in a quick and loose manner. It involves using rapid, energetic lines to convey the overall pose and action of a figure or object. Embellish. To embellish means to add decorative details or embellishments to a drawing. It involves adding intricate patterns, textures, or additional elements to enhance the visual appeal of the artwork. Remember to practice regularly, experiment with different techniques, and enjoy the process of drawing. Each of these verbs adds a unique dimension to your artistic vocabulary and allows you to express yourself creatively. Have fun exploring and expanding your drawing skills. Leave your comment and great like for Vaya. See you later. Is there a man or a woman in this picture? There is a man in the picture. What is the man doing? The man is cooking. How is he cooking? He is cooking on a grill or barbecue. Is the grill barbecue very hot? Yes, it is very hot. You cannot touch it. As it would be very hot. What is he cooking on the grill barbecue? He is cooking food on the grill barbecue. But it is not specified what exactly he is cooking. What do you think he is cooking? He could be cooking hot dogs and hamburgers, maybe sausages, or possibly hamburgers. What is he cooking? It's not specified, but it looks like he is cooking some kind of meat. Do you like to cook, Luke? Yes, I do, Luke. What do you like to cook? I like to cook eggs. That's great. It's wonderful that you enjoy cooking a variety of dishes. Cooking eggs on many days, like Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, sounds like a delicious and convenient choice. Hamburgers are also a tasty option to cook and enjoy. Exploring different recipes and experimenting with various ingredients can make the cooking experience even more enjoyable. Keep up the culinary adventures. Is there a man or a woman in this picture? There is a man in the picture. What is the man doing? The man is cooking. How is he cooking? He is cooking on a grill or barbecue. Is the grill barbecue very hot? Yes, it is very hot. You cannot touch it. As it would be very hot. What is he cooking on the grill barbecue? He is cooking food on the grill barbecue. But it is not specified what exactly he is cooking. What do you think he is cooking? He could be cooking hot dogs and hamburgers, maybe sausages, or possibly hamburgers. What is he cooking? It's not specified, but it looks like he is cooking some kind of meat. Do you like to cook, Luke? Yes, I do, Luke. What do you like to cook? I like to cook eggs. That's great. It's wonderful that you enjoy cooking a variety of dishes. Cooking eggs on many days, like Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, sounds like a delicious and convenient choice. Hamburgers are also a tasty option to cook and enjoy. Exploring different recipes and experimenting with various ingredients can make the cooking experience even more enjoyable. Keep up the culinary adventures. Is there a man or a woman in this picture? There is a man in the picture. What is the man doing? The man is cooking. How is he cooking? He is cooking on a grill or barbecue. Is the grill barbecue very hot? Yes, it is very hot. You cannot touch it. As it would be very hot. 
What is he cooking on the grill, barbecue? He is cooking food on the grill, barbecue. But it is not specified what exactly he is cooking. What do you think he is cooking? He could be cooking hot dogs and hamburgers, maybe sausages, or possibly hamburgers. What is he cooking? It's not specified, but it looks like he is cooking some kind of meat. Do you like to cook, Luke? Yes, I do, Luke. What do you like to cook? I like to cook eggs. That's great. It's wonderful that you enjoy cooking a variety of dishes. Cooking eggs on many days, like Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, sounds like a delicious and convenient choice. Hamburgers are also a tasty option to cook and enjoy. Exploring different recipes and experimenting with various ingredients can make the cooking experience even more enjoyable. Keep up the culinary adventures. Sauté sodding is a quick cooking method where you cook ingredients in a small amount of oil or butter over high heat. It helps to develop rich flavors and textures. You can sauté onions, mushrooms, or garlic for adding depth to your dishes. Steam. Steaming is a healthy cooking technique where you cook food using steam. It helps to retain nutrients and natural flavors. You can steam vegetables, fish, or dumplings by placing them in a steamer. Blend. Blending involves combining ingredients using a blender or food processor to create smooth mixtures. You can blend fruits for smoothies or puree vegetables for sauces and soups. Garnish. Garnishing is the final touch you add to a dish to enhance its presentation and flavor. You can garnish a plate of food with fresh herbs, lemon wedges. Or a sprinkle of grated cheese. Taste tasting is an important part of the cooking process. It involves sampling the food to check its flavors and make any necessary adjustments. Remember to taste your dishes as you cook to ensure they are seasoned to your liking. By familiarizing yourself with these easy English verbs, you can expand your culinary vocabulary and improve your English language skills while having fun in the kitchen. Happy cooking! Put your like and comment. See you later. Apart from sports and water activities, the beach is also a great place for leisurely walks along the shoreline. Taking a stroll while enjoying the scenic views can be incredibly peaceful and therapeutic. It's an opportunity to connect with nature, clear your mind, and appreciate the beauty of the coastal landscape. Furthermore, the beach provides an excellent backdrop for socializing and spending quality time with friends and family. Building sandcastles, playing beach games, or simply lounging under beach umbrellas while engaging in conversations and laughter create lasting memories and strengthen bonds. Additionally, the beach offers a diverse ecosystem that nature enthusiasts can explore, from observing fascinating marine life in tide pools to birdwatching along the shoreline. There are numerous opportunities to appreciate the rich biodiversity that exists in coastal areas. Lastly, let's not forget the culinary delights that often accompany a beach visit. Many coastal regions are known for their fresh seafood and beachside restaurants that serve delicious meals with a view. Indulging in local delicacies while enjoying the seaside ambience adds a delightful dimension to the beach experience. So. Whether you're a beach lover or someone who prefers other natural landscapes, there's no denying that the beach offers a range of activities and experiences for everyone to enjoy. It's a place where you can unwind, have fun, and create beautiful memories. Thank you for watching today's video. I encourage you to leave a comment and share your favorite beach activities. I look forward to our next video. Aside from dinner, my wife's cooking extends to breakfast as well. She makes scrumptious pancakes, which I enjoy with maple syrup and peanut butter—a combination that might sound unusual, but is absolutely delicious. Another breakfast favorite of mine is chilaquiles, a traditional Mexican dish made with tortilla chips, salsa, cheese, cream, and topped with eggs. It's a dish I can never resist. In my family, we cook dinner five days a week, and on other days, we either eat out or have dinner with relatives. Dinner time is important for us as we gather around the table, share our day's experiences, and enjoy a meal together. 
It's a cherished tradition that we continue to uphold. While I may not possess impressive cooking skills, I am open to trying different cuisines from around the world. I appreciate the opportunity to explore new flavors and dishes. Currently, I don't have plans to learn cooking extensively, as I prefer being on the receiving end of delicious meals. However, who knows what the future holds, certainly. Here are a few additional thoughts and insights on the topic. Cooking is not just about preparing meals. It can also be a creative and therapeutic activity. Many people find joy and satisfaction in experimenting with different ingredients, flavors, and cooking techniques. It allows them to express their culinary skills and create unique dishes. Furthermore, cooking can be a great way to bond with family and friends. Gathering in the kitchen, sharing recipes, and cooking together can create memorable experiences and strengthen relationships. It's an opportunity to learn from each other, exchange culinary tips, and enjoy the process of preparing a meal as a team. In recent years, there has been a growing interest in healthy cooking and mindful eating. Many individuals are becoming more conscious of the ingredients they use and their nutritional value. They seek out fresh, locally sourced produce and aim to incorporate a variety of nutritious elements into their meals. This emphasis on healthy cooking promotes overall well-being and can have a positive impact on one's lifestyle. Additionally, cooking can be a gateway to exploring different cultures and their cuisines. Trying out recipes from various regions allows you to experience new flavors, ingredients, and cooking styles. It broadens your culinary horizons and deepens your appreciation for the diverse gastronomic traditions that exist around the world. Finally, with the rise of social media and online platforms, cooking has become more accessible than ever before. There are countless cooking channels, websites, and blogs dedicated to sharing recipes, cooking techniques, and culinary inspiration. These resources enable aspiring cooks to learn and improve their skills at their own pace, making the culinary world more inclusive and empowering. Whether you're a seasoned chef or a novice in the kitchen, cooking offers a multitude of benefits and possibilities. It's a skill that can be cultivated and enjoyed by anyone, regardless of their level of expertise. So embrace the joy of cooking, explore new flavors, and savor the delicious results of your culinary adventures. Thank you for watching this video. Please leave a comment and let me know if you enjoy cooking. I look forward to our next video. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining me in this B1 English listening practice video. This video is designed to help you enhance your listening and comprehension skills while I speak. Today, I will be discussing the topic of beach activities. While the beach is a popular destination for many people, I must admit that I belong to the minority who don't particularly love it. Although I occasionally enjoy going to the beach, I personally prefer other types of environments. However, let's explore the various exciting beach activities that you can engage in. First and foremost, there are numerous sports that can be played on the sand, such as volleyball, soccer, and football. Despite my mixed feelings about the beach, I must confess that beach volleyball is one sport that I thoroughly enjoy. There's something exhilarating about diving and maneuvering in the sand, and being tall gives me an advantage in spiking the ball over the net. While soccer and football can also be entertaining to play on the beach, I find them more enjoyable on regular grass fields where movement is easier, and there's more space to play. Apart from sports, sunbathing is a popular beach activity, unfortunately. This is something I can't do due to my tendency to easily get sunburned. If I spend a few hours under the sun, I end up looking like a ripe tomato. I'm sure some of you can relate, as some people tan while others suffer from severe sunburns. I recall one of my worst sunburn experiences when I went on a long bike ride wearing a sleeveless shirt, thinking the cloudy weather would protect me from the sun. Needless to say, my arms peeled for quite some time afterwards. Now, let's shift our focus to water activities. During my upbringing, I enjoyed boogie boarding, 
which I find quite entertaining. However, it doesn't possess the same level of coolness as surfing. Boogie boarding involves lying on a rectangular board and riding the waves as they propel you towards the shore. It's a fun experience. Lately, I've been contemplating learning how to surf, as some of my students who are surfers have shared their positive experiences with me. It sounds intriguing, and I might give it a try, although I don't anticipate becoming proficient at it. Additionally, there are other captivating water activities like kite surfing, windsurfing, jet skiing, and sailing. I have tried sailing before, but only in bay areas, not in the open ocean. Sailing is an appealing endeavor, but it requires extensive practice, training, and commitment, which makes it unlikely for me to pursue. Despite not being a beach enthusiast, there are two primary reasons for my preference. Firstly, I have fair skin that easily burns under the sun. Secondly, when I have free time, I prefer exploring other scenic places such as mountains, forests, countryside, and even deserts. It's not that I dislike the beach. I simply find other natural settings more appealing. Nevertheless, I consider myself fortunate to have lived near the beach for most of my life. I'd like to add a few more thoughts and insights from my side regarding beach activities. While beach sports and water activities are undoubtedly exciting, the beach itself offers a unique atmosphere and a sense of tranquility that can be quite appealing. The sound of the waves crashing against the shore, the feel of the warm sand between your toes, and the refreshing sea breeze all contribute to a relaxing and rejuvenating experience. Apart from sports and water activities, the beach is also a great place for leisurely walks along the shoreline. Taking a stroll while enjoying the scenic views can be incredibly peaceful and therapeutic. It's an opportunity to connect with nature, clear your mind, and appreciate the beauty of the coastal landscape. Furthermore, the beach provides an excellent backdrop for socializing and spending quality time with friends and family. Building sandcastles, playing beach games, or simply lounging under beach umbrellas while engaging in conversations and laughter create lasting memories and strengthen bonds. Additionally, the beach offers a diverse ecosystem that nature enthusiasts can explore. From observing fascinating marine life in tide pools to birdwatching along the shoreline, there are numerous opportunities to appreciate the rich biodiversity that exists in coastal areas. Lastly, let's not forget the culinary delights that often accompany a beach visit. Many coastal regions are known for their fresh seafood and beachside restaurants that serve delicious meals with a view. Indulging in local delicacies while enjoying the seaside ambience adds a delightful dimension to the beach experience. So, whether you're a beach lover or someone who prefers other natural landscapes, there's no denying that the beach offers a range of activities and experiences for everyone to enjoy. It's a place where you can unwind, have fun, and create beautiful memories. Thank you for watching today's video. I encourage you to leave a comment and share your favorite beach activities. I look forward to our next video. Speaking of Europe, a few years ago, I took a backpacking trip through Portugal and Spain. It was my first time backpacking, and it wasn't easy. We spent a lot of time walking and taking buses and trains with our big backpacks on our backs. We stayed in some low-quality hostels and had some bad experiences. The worst thing that happened to me was being bitten by bed bugs in Madrid. It's not a fun experience, especially for someone like me with sensitive skin. I ended up with big swollen sores all over my arms. If you plan on staying in hostels, I recommend reading online reviews first. Sometimes it's worth paying a little more to stay in a better place. Some people prefer hotels, while others enjoy staying in Airbnb accommodations. Lately, I've been staying at Airbnbs no matter where I travel. In my opinion, it's better than staying in hostels. Another important aspect of travel is the flight. Honestly, it's probably the worst part of traveling. I've been lucky to not have any really bad flights, but I have experienced long delays and canceled flights, 
which can really ruin your trip. There were even a couple of times when I had to spend the night at the airport, and it was terrible. I hope you never have to go through that experience. Overall, there are both good and bad things about traveling. However, I think we can all agree that it's nice to travel once in a while. That's all for today. Leave a comment and let me know your favorite place that you've traveled to. I'll see you in the next video. Hello everyone, welcome to this A2 English listening practice video. You can use this video to improve your listening and comprehension skills as I speak. Are you ready today? I'm going to talk about travel. Traveling is one of the most enjoyable activities. I've always loved traveling. When I was young, my family and I traveled to Hawaii many times. In case you're not familiar with Hawaii, it's an island located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and is also one of the 50 states of the U.S. I've been there about six or seven times, though I don't remember the exact number. It's definitely one of my favorite places in the world. Hawaii has plenty of beautiful beaches, and the lifestyle there is slow and calm. However, even though Hawaii is one of my favorite travel destinations in general, I prefer the countryside, forests, or mountains over the beach. I love taking camping trips and road trips. I've taken several road trips through the U.S. in the past, and recently, I had the incredible experience of a road trip through the Tuscany region of Italy. Trust me, if you ever get the chance to go to Italy, I highly recommend renting a car and driving through Tuscany. You won't be disappointed. Hello everyone, welcome to this A1 English listening practice video. This video is designed to help you enhance your listening skills and comprehension abilities. Are you ready today? I want to discuss the journey of language learning. If you're watching this video, chances are you're currently engaged in learning English. Therefore, I hope this topic is of great interest to you. It's important to acknowledge that learning a language can be challenging, and it requires a significant investment of time dedicated to studying. The aspect of time is crucial when it comes to language learning. Without dedicating ample time to studying, it's difficult to make progress and acquire proficiency in English. Patience and persistence are key. As a language teacher, I also consider myself a language learner. I find great joy in learning different languages and engaging in conversations with people from various countries. This is one of the most rewarding aspects of acquiring another language, the ability to communicate with and make new friends from different cultures. I've had the opportunity to interact with individuals from diverse backgrounds, and it has enriched my language learning experience. Nevertheless, it's essential to recognize that language learning is not without its challenges. There are times when I feel frustrated or saddened by my inability to understand someone or express myself fluently. It's natural to experience such emotions when engaging with foreign languages, but it's important to embrace them. Making mistakes is an integral part of the language learning process. I often encounter grammar, vocabulary, and pronunciation errors when speaking in other languages. However, making mistakes is normal and should not deter you. Everyone makes mistakes when learning a new language. In fact, making mistakes is crucial for improvement. To enhance your skills and become more proficient, you must actively engage in conversations practice regularly, and most importantly, have fun. Therefore, don't be overly concerned about making mistakes. Instead, enjoy the process of learning English. If you approach it with a sense of enjoyment, the learning journey becomes more rewarding. Now, let's explore some tips to make learning English an enjoyable experience. Tip number one, read books in English that align with your interests. Avoid reading dull and uninteresting books. Instead, find books that captivate your attention. For instance, if you're a sports enthusiast, read English books related to sports. If you have a fondness for animals, explore English literature about animals. Similarly, if technology intrigues you, delve into English books focusing on technology. Personally, I find joy in reading fiction books in various languages. 
This not only entertains me but also aids in my language learning. Tip number two. Watch English videos that cater to your interests. If you have a passion for fashion and clothing, watch YouTube videos about fashion in English. If cars fascinate you, explore English videos centered around automobiles. It's crucial to consume content that aligns with your interests. Tip number three. Foster friendships with English speakers and fellow English learners. Building connections may not be easy, but it greatly contributes to language learning and provides opportunities for practice. Seek out English practice groups in your local community or consider joining language exchange programs through platforms like meetup.com. Engaging in conversations with friends who speak English fluently or are also learning the language can significantly enhance your skills. That concludes our discussion for today. Please leave a comment and share your reasons for learning English. I look forward to our next video. Hi everyone and this is Octavia. Learn English easily with Octavia is a unique channel that sets itself apart from others by offering a refreshing and innovative approach to English language learning. With Octavia as your guide, you'll discover a dynamic and engaging learning experience that makes mastering English enjoyable and accessible to learners of all levels. What makes this channel truly special is Octavia's expertise in simplifying complex language concepts and breaking them down into easy-to-understand lessons. Her teaching style is interactive, incorporating a variety of multimedia resources such as videos, quizzes, and practical exercises to reinforce your understanding and retention of the material. Unlike traditional language learning channels, Learn English Easily with Octavia focuses on providing practical, real-life examples and scenarios that enable you to apply your newfound knowledge in everyday situations. Octavia's emphasis on conversational skills ensures that you not only develop a strong foundation in grammar and vocabulary, but also gain the confidence to communicate effectively in English. Furthermore, Octavia understands the importance of individualized learning, and her channel offers a diverse range of content tailored to different learning preferences and goals. Whether you prefer visual learning, audio exercises, or interactive discussions, Learn English easily with Octavia has it all. Octavia also encourages learner participation through live sessions, Q&A sessions, and community engagement, creating a supportive environment for learners to connect and grow together. In summary, Learn English easily with Octavia stands out from other channels by providing a dynamic, interactive, and learner-centered approach to English language learning. With Octavia as your trusted guide, you'll embark on an exciting journey towards fluency, gaining the skills and confidence to communicate effectively in English in no time. Mastering English Made Easy, Practical Lessons for Everyday Fluency, About Us. Welcome to our channel, where we are dedicated to helping you master the English language. Whether you're a beginner or seeking to refine your skills, we offer comprehensive tutorials that cover grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation, and more. Why watch our videos, engaging and interactive lessons? Our lessons are designed to be interactive and keep you engaged throughout the learning process. Practical examples and exercises. We provide practical examples and exercises to help you apply what you've learned in real-life situations. Tips for everyday conversations and professional use. We offer valuable tips that will enhance your everyday conversations and professional communication skills. Regular updates with fresh content. We consistently update our channel with fresh content, ensuring that you have access to the latest and most relevant English language lessons. Why subscribe? Be the first to access our latest videos. By subscribing to our channel, you will be the first to access our newest videos as soon as they are released. Join a community of enthusiastic learners. Join our community of enthusiastic learners who are passionate about mastering the English language. Interact with fellow learners, share experiences, and support one another on this language learning journey. Enhance your learning with our structured approach. Our structured approach to teaching English will help you build a strong foundation and systematically improve your language skills. 
How to stay updated? Subscribe and turn on notifications. Subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications to receive alerts whenever we upload new videos. Like our videos to support us. Show your support by liking our videos. Your likes motivate us to continue creating valuable content for you. Share your thoughts and suggestions in the comments. We value your feedback and suggestions. Leave your comments on our videos and let us know how we can further assist you in your language learning journey. Your journey to fluency starts here. Begin your journey to English fluency by subscribing to our channel today. Transform your English skills and gain confidence in your abilities. Your likes, shares, and subscriptions inspire us to create more valuable content for you. Stay connected. Follow us on social media links for additional tips, updates, and resources. Thank you for being a part of our learning community. Let's make the process of learning English enjoyable and effective together. Hi again, this is Vio. Let's explore a few straightforward tips to improve your American English pronunciation. One notable tip involves a common habit found among Americans, which is substituting an for end. Pay attention to how phrases like my friends and I often become my friends and I in casual conversation. This pattern, where and is shortened to an, is prevalent in many expressions, such as you and I becoming you and I. This tendency to abbreviate and to n is widespread, highlighting the importance of recognizing these subtle differences in everyday speech. Another observation I've made, particularly from watching a lot of YouTube content, involves the way certain creators emphasize specific words. This technique greatly aids understanding, especially in complex subjects. Take, for example, Graham Stephan, a personal finance blogger. In his videos, he has a unique way of highlighting key phrases. As seen in a video where he discusses seven daily habits that changed my life, notice the emphasis placed on critical words, making the content more accessible. It's important to note that this deliberate emphasis isn't necessarily how he speaks off camera, but rather a strategic choice for clarity in his videos. This method of stressing significant words is not exclusive to YouTube. It can be applied in various contexts to enhance communication and comprehension. Let's jump right in with some simple tips to improve your American English pronunciation. Here's a cool trick many Americans use. They shorten the end sound at the end of words. For instance, in casual conversation, my friends and I often becomes my friends and me. This pattern, where and becomes n, is common in lots of phrases. You and I can turn into you and me too. Recognizing these subtle changes in everyday speech is key. Another thing I've noticed, especially watching YouTube, is how creators play up certain words. This technique really helps understanding, especially complex topics. Take Graham Stephan, a personal finance YouTuber, in his videos. He has a unique way of stressing important phrases. For example, in a video about seven daily habits that changed my life, listen to how he emphasizes key words. This makes the content clearer. This deliberate emphasis isn't necessarily how he speaks in real life. But it's a smart choice for clarity in his videos. Stressing important words isn't just a YouTube thing either. It reflects the way Americans commonly speak in everyday situations, enhancing the clarity and impact of their words. Examples like I'm going to buy milk or oh my god, I love that painting illustrate this point. Paying attention to this can provide valuable insights into effective communication, particularly in making complex information more understandable. My third favorite tip involves the strategic use of interjections, which not only make conversations sound more authentically American, but also offer a brief moment to gather your thoughts before continuing. For instance, the interjection wow can significantly enhance the expressiveness of a statement, as in wow, that's amazing, moving on. A common practice among Americans that you've likely noticed is the abbreviation of phrases like going to and wanted to gonna and wanna. This linguistic shortcut is something my American friends have passed on to me, and it's a staple in everyday American speech. 
For example, the formal I'm going to go to the store to pick up some groceries often becomes I'm gonna go grab some groceries. Similarly, do you want to go to dinner? Is frequently shortened to wanna go to dinner? This casual form of speech is prevalent across various contexts from making plans to expressing desires, like wanna go shopping or I wanna go to New York for spring break. However, it's important to maintain the correct grammatical form in more formal contexts. This mirrors how Americans naturally speak in everyday situations, making their words clearer and more impactful. Think about how we say things like, I'm gonna buy milk, or, oh my gosh, I love that painting. These examples show how emphasizing words can make your point clearer. Paying attention to this can be a real asset for effective communication, especially when it comes to explaining complex things in a way people understand. My third favorite tip is about using interjections strategically. These little words not only make your English sound more American, but they also give you a quick moment to collect your thoughts before you keep talking. For example, saying wow, that's amazing, adds a lot more expression than just saying that's amazing. Another thing you've probably noticed is how Americans shorten phrases. We turn things like going to and want to into gonna and wanna. This is a super common shortcut in everyday American speech. For instance, the formal way to say I'm going to the store to pick up groceries might become I'm gonna grab some groceries in casual conversation. Similarly, do you want to go to dinner? Often gets shortened to wanna go to dinner. This casual way of speaking is used in all kinds of situations, from making plans want to go shopping, to expressing desires I want to go to New York for spring break. Just remember, in more formal settings, it's important to use proper grammar. Of course, it's important to use wants to instead of the super casual want to in formal situations. Contexts from making plans to expressing desires, like want to go shopping, or I want to go to New York for spring break. However, it's important to maintain the correct grammatical form in more formal contexts. This mirrors how Americans naturally speak in everyday situations, making their words clearer and more impactful. Think about how we say things like, I'm gonna buy milk, or, oh my gosh, I love that painting. These examples show how emphasizing words can make your point clearer. Paying attention to this can be a real asset for effective communication, especially when it comes to explaining complex things in a way people understand. My third favorite tip is about using interjections strategically. These little words not only make your English sound more American, but they also give you a quick moment to collect your thoughts before you keep talking. For example, saying wow, that's amazing, adds a lot more expression than just saying that's amazing. Another thing you've probably noticed is how Americans shorten phrases. We turn things like going to and want to into gonna and wanna. This is a super common shortcut in everyday American speech. For instance, the formal way to say I'm going to the store to pick up groceries might become I'm gonna grab some groceries in casual conversation. Similarly, do you want to go to dinner? Often gets shortened to wanna go to dinner. This casual way of speaking is used in all kinds of situations, from making plans want to go shopping, to expressing desires I want to go to New York for spring break. Just remember, in more formal settings, it's important to use proper grammar. Of course, it's important to use wants to instead of the super casual wanna in formal situations. Hi again, this is Vio. Let's explore a few straightforward tips to improve your American English pronunciation. One notable tip involves a common habit found among Americans, which is substituting an for end. Pay attention to how phrases like my friends and I often become my friends and I in casual conversation. This pattern, where and is shortened to an, is prevalent in many expressions, such as you and I becoming you and I this tendency to abbreviate and to n is widespread, highlighting the importance of recognizing these subtle differences in everyday speech. Another observation I've made, particularly from watching a lot of YouTube content, involves the way certain creators emphasize specific words. This technique greatly aids understanding, especially in complex subjects. Take, for example, 
Graham Stephan, a personal finance blogger. In his videos, he has a unique way of highlighting key phrases. As seen in a video where he discusses seven daily habits that changed my life, notice the emphasis placed on critical words, making the content more accessible. It's important to note that this deliberate emphasis isn't necessarily how he speaks off camera, but rather a strategic choice for clarity in his videos. This method of stressing significant words is not exclusive to YouTube. It can be applied in various contexts to enhance communication and comprehension. Let's jump right in with some simple tips to improve your American English pronunciation. Here's a cool trick many Americans use. They shorten the end sound at the end of words. For instance, in casual conversation, my friends and I often becomes my friends and me. This pattern, where end becomes n, is common in lots of phrases. You and I can turn into you and me too. Recognizing these subtle changes in everyday speech is key. Hex serves as the milder counterpart to hell, often used to maintain politeness or when a less harsh term is preferred. It is common among both children and adults seeking a gentler alternative. On the other hand, hell might appear in more adult dialogues, reflecting stronger emotions or emphasis. Expressions like what the heck are you doing or why the hell did you do that are not just queries but convey a range of feelings including annoyance or astonishment. These phrases can intensify a statement's emotional weight. Whether expressing frustration like why the heck did we buy this house or confusion like where in the heck did I put my keys. While these words can inject humor or emphasis into conversations, it's wise to use them judiciously, especially in formal contexts or with certain audiences to avoid potential offense. They are best reserved for informal settings among friends or colleagues. Imagine you're at a football game with your American buddies. If something crazy happens and you can't believe it, you might yell out what the heck just happened or what the hell are they doing? These are perfect expressions to show how surprised or frustrated you are by the game. Phrases like who the heck is that guy can also come in handy during these heated discussions. See how versatile heck and hell can be. They're not just for everyday conversations, they're all over pop culture too. For example, Taylor Swift uses hell for emphasis in her song Wildest Dreams when she sings about someone being handsome as hell meaning incredibly attractive. This shows how these terms can be used in many ways and add a lot of expression to your American English. Finally, I want to talk about a challenge that's probably close to both our hearts, using articles A and the. Coming from a Russian background where articles aren't used, I found this especially tricky. I remember winning an English competition in Russia when I was 16 and then visiting friends in the UK. I asked them to check out my English. And while they said I spoke fluently, they noticed I wasn't always using articles correctly. This was a common mistake in my speaking. And their feedback was a real wake-up call. Now, let's imagine yourself enjoying a football match with your American pals. In moments of disbelief or frustration, you might exclaim, What the hell are they doing? Or what the heck just happened? These expressions are perfect for conveying your astonishment or irritation with the game's events. Phrases like who the hell are you also find their place in such lively discussions. The versatility of hack and hell extends beyond everyday conversations. They are also prevalent in popular culture. For instance, Taylor Swift uses hell for emphasis in her song Wildest Dreams, describing someone as handsome as hell to mean exceptionally attractive. This example illustrates the broad applicability and expressive power of these terms in American English. Finally, I want to touch on a challenge that's particularly close to my heart and perhaps yours as well. It is the use of articles, a concept starting with the letter A, coming from a Russian background where articles are non-existent. I found this aspect of English particularly tricky. I recall winning an English competition in Russia at 16 and visiting friends in the UK, asking them to evaluate my English. They complimented my fluency but pointed out my inconsistent use of articles. 
A common oversight in my speech. This feedback was eye-opening. Articles A and the are a big part of American English. And if you leave them out, people will definitely notice. To sound more like a native speaker, you really need to use A and and the correctly in your sentences. For instance, saying when we were in Hawaii, we visited the Big Island or can you pick up a dozen eggs when you go to the store? Shows how articles help us give specific details. Another example is the term an all-nighter, which means staying up all night to work or study. This shows how articles can make your meaning clearer. American English also has a way of blending words together sometimes. For instance, we might say have to instead of half past two. This can be a little tricky for learners because it makes the language flow more smoothly, but it can also be confusing at first. Learning how to use articles correctly and understanding when words might be blended together can really improve your American English and make you sound more natural and understandable to native speakers. These are just a few simple tips to help you improve your American English accent. I'll be sharing more advice in future videos, so stay tuned. I'm interested to hear which tip you're going to try first to make your English sound more American. As articles are a staple in American English and their absence is noticeable, it's crucial to incorporate a am appropriately in your sentences to sound more native. For instance, saying when we were in Hawaii, we visited the Big Island or can you pick up a dozen eggs when you go to the store highlights the importance of articles in conveying specific details. Another example is the term an all-nighter, referring to staying up all night to complete work or prepare for a test, showcasing how articles can add clarity to your statements. Moreover, blending words like half and to into half to is a quintessential American English trait, showcasing the language's fluidity and sometimes posing comprehension challenges for learners. Mastering the use of articles and understanding the nuances of word blending can significantly enhance your American English proficiency, making your speech more natural and understandable to native speakers. To wrap up, these straightforward strategies are designed to enhance your American English accent, and I'm eager to share even more insights in upcoming videos. I'm curious to hear which tip you're planning to apply to make your English sound more American. A huge thank you to everyone who watched this video through to the end. I trust you found the information valuable and that you'll begin integrating these suggestions into your daily speech right away. Take care, and I look forward to connecting with you in future videos. Goodbye. Hello everyone, this is Vaya. Today we will learn English with Albert Einstein Wuo. Chapter 1 Young Albert, Albert Einstein was born in a small German town called Alm on March 14, 1879. His mother Pauline was a killing woman who loved music. His father Hermann was a merchant who sold feathers. Albert had a younger sister named Maria, who was his only sibling. Albert's parents noticed that he was different. For other children, as a baby he was quiet and seemed to think a lot. He started talking later than most children. His parents were worried about this, but as Albert grew older, they saw that he was just deep in thought. He liked to figure things out by himself. Their home in Alm was comfortable, but it was not a rich home. They did not have many things, but they had enough. Albert's mother played the piano, and the sound of music often filled their home. This sparked Albert's love for music, a love he kept all his life. When Albert was five years old, his father showed him a compass. A compass is a small tool that points north because of the Earth's magnetic field. This compass made a big impact on Albert. He could not understand how it worked. How could something invisible make the needle move? He thought about this a lot. This was the start of Albert's interest in science. Albert went to a Catholic school in Munich because his parents thought it was the best school in the city. But he did not like the way they taught things there. They wanted students to learn by memorizing, but Albert preferred to learn by understanding. Albert's family was Jewish, but they were not fairly religious. They did not go to the synagogue often, 
And they did not follow many Jewish traditions. But they were proud of their Jewish heritage. Later in life, Albert would stand up for Jewish people. And other groups were treated unfairly. In these early years, Albert learned many important things. He learned about love from his family. About music from his mother. About business from his father. And about fairness from his own heart. But most importantly, he learned it about the joy of understanding the world. This joy would guide his life and lead him to make great discoveries in science. In the next part, we will learn about an event that happened. When Albert was a young boy, this event changed his life and started his journey to becoming one of the most famous scientists in the world when Albert was five years old. His father, Herman, gave him a small gift. It was not a toy or a book. It was a compass. A compass is a simple tool that shows which way is north. But to young Albert, it was much more than that. It was a mystery, a puzzle that he could not solve. Albert looked at the compass and saw the small needle inside. The needle was not touching anything. There was no string pulling it. No hand pushing it. But still it moved. It always pointed in the same direction towards the north. Albert was amazed. He could not understand how it worked. How could something invisible make the needle move? He asked his father and his teachers, but their answers did not satisfy him. They told him that the compass worked because of something called magnetism. But they could not explain what magnetism was. Or how it worked, this made Albert even more curious. He wanted to find out the answer by himself. Albert began to think about the compass all the time. He thought about it at school, at home even in his dreams. He read books about magnetism and electricity. He did experiments with magnets. He tried to imagine what it would be like if he could see the invisible forces that made the compass needle move. This was the beginning of Albert's love for physics. Physics is the science that explains how the world works. It tells us why the sky is blue, why the earth goes around the sun, and why a compass points north. Albert wanted to understand all these things. He wanted to solve the mysteries of the universe. The compass mystery taught Albert an important lesson. It showed him that the world is full of wonders. And that science can help us understand these wonders. It also showed him that it is okay to ask questions. And to be curious, this is how we learn and grow. Albert Einstein was a very curious child. He liked to ask questions and to explore the world around him. He wanted to understand everything. But when he went to school, he faced some challenges. In those days, schools were very different from today. Teachers did not encourage students to ask questions or to think creatively. They wanted students to learn by memorizing facts and rules. They believed that this was the best way to learn. But Albert did not agree. Albert did not like memorizing things. He thought it was boring and useless. He wanted to understand things, not just remember them. He wanted to know why things happened. Not just what happened. He believed that learning should be a journey of discovery, not a task of memorization. Albert's teachers did not understand him. They thought he was lazy and disrespectful. They did not like his questions and his arguments. They thought he was a troublemaker, but Albert was not trying to cause trouble. He was just trying to learn in his own way. Albert's parents were worried about him. They wanted him to do well in school and to have a good future. They tried to help him, but they did not know how. They did not understand why Albert was so different from other children. Despite these challenges, Albert did not give up. He kept asking questions and seeking answers. He kept reading books and doing experiments. He kept dreaming about the mysteries of the universe. The school challenges made Albert stronger. They taught him to be independent and to trust his own mind. They showed him that it is okay to be different and that it is important to stand up for what you believe in. 
These lessons helped Albert to become the great scientist that he was. In the end, Albert Einstein did not fit into the traditional education system. But that did not stop him from learning and growing. He found his own path a path that led him to make some of the most important discoveries in the history of science in the next chapter. We will follow Albert as he continues his journey. We will see how he went from being a rebellious student to becoming one of the most famous scientists. In the world chapter 2, The Path to Physics, after finishing school, Albert Einstein decided to continue his education. He wanted to learn more about the world and the way it works. He chose to study physics and mathematics because these subjects fascinated him the most for this. He moved to a city in Switzerland called Zurich. There he attended a school known as the Polytechnic Institute. The Polytechnic Institute was a very good school for science and technology. The teachers there were experts in their fields. And the students were some of the brightest. Young minds in Europe, Albert was excited to be there. He was looking forward to learning new things and meeting new people. Life in Zurich was very different. From life in Germany, the city was bigger and busier. The people spoke a different language called Swiss German. At first, Albert had trouble understanding this language, but he studied hard and soon got used to it. He also made friends who helped him adjust to his new life. Studying at the Polytechnic Institute was not easy. The classes were hard and the exams were tough. Albert had to work hard to keep up, but he enjoyed the challenge. He loved learning about physics and mathematics. He loved solving problems and discovering new things. He spent many hours in the library reading books and taking notes. One of his favorite subjects was theoretical physics. This is the part of physics that deals with ideas and theories rather than experiments. It involves a lot of thinking and imagining. Albert was good at this. He had a strong imagination and a sharp mind. He could think about difficult ideas and understand complex theories during his university years. Albert grew a lot as a person and as a student. He learned to live on his own and to take care of himself. He learned to study hard and to work independently. He also learned to think deeply and to question everything. These skills would serve in well in the future, despite the challenges. Albert enjoyed his time at the Polytechnic Institute. He learned a lot and made many friends. He graduated with a degree in physics in 19, ready to start his career as a scientist. In the next part, we will learn about Albert's first job. It was not a job in a university or a research lab, but in a place you might not expect. This job played an important role in Albert's life and career. It helped him develop his ideas and make him